Pranakosha live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today we have the one, the only, Wesley Ur from Land of the Lost. Can you believe it? <laughs> hey Matt, how are you? Hey, pretty good. Well, I see you got the slee stacks on your shirt. I do, I do, yes. Yeah. It's, 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 the closest, it's as close as I want them to get to me these days. Oh, okay. Every kid I know that watched Land of the Lost, you know, back in the 70s, and it's been in reruns ever since, but right. had nightmares about the slee stack. Yeah, I, that's the one thing that's imprinted in my brain, too, that I immediately think of is... Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> no. So they, they were all UCLA basketball players, too, and we had a really famous Lee Stack. Ooh. One of the guys, Bill Lambeer of the Detroit Pistons, okay. who became the bad boy of basketball, was a Lee Stack. And he's like this nasty... He was, in basketball, he was, he was the worst... So he like elbowed people and did all these things you're not oh, allowed horrible. to do. And a few years ago, I, we, Kathy and I, we were at the Star Trek convention at the Rio in okay. Vegas. It's where I met you, by the way. Yeah, and we got to tell and, that story too. But we we made we made a, a a call to the head of the league, and we made arrangements to go. He was coaching the Aces, the, okay, the, in in Las Vegas. And Kathy and I go, and all the women, it was a women's basketball team, and they had an eight by 10 of the slee sack. And he didn't know we were coming. And as soon as we walked in, we had a slee sack head and all sorts of stuff. And, and the ladies put the slee sack thing head in front of them. And he looked around like, what the hell is going on here? And he looked at us and he went, you could just see it re finally registered who we were, because gosh knows, I don't look like I used to. Well, you know what's funny is now, I mean, okay, here's the story. So the way we met, I was at Star Trek Las Vegas, okay, last summer in, at the Rio. And I think it was like maybe a couple of days into it. And it's lunchtime and I'm walking down the hall, try, you know, trying to just, you know, be cool and whatever, minding my own business. And suddenly I'm like, <whistles> I'm like, who the hell's cat calling me? So I turn around and there's this old guy here and, I'm, and he's like, and I'm like, who are you? And, he, and I was like, were you the one like whistling at me? And he goes, what is that supposed to mean? And then you said, if you can remember, it means we think you're cute. And I'm thinking, okay. So then. Not, that's not how we met, by the way. Yes, it is. No, I, it met is you so... in, I met you in an elevator. That's. We first met in an elevator. And that's when I was being silly with you because we'd met coming down an elevator at the Rio. Oh, I forgot. And that's I, where we met. And so when we saw you walking, we were going, you know, we were going like cat calling you, trying to make you turn around. And that's what, what that's that's the true story of what happened. Oh, I for, I completely blanked out the elevator meet. The elevator is the first time we met. Oh, well, now it makes a little more sense. Well, anyways, <laughs> however, I was in the right frame of mind. So I had a I had the perfect response. So I turned around to this guy who's whistling at me and I go. I think what you mean is that you like my shirt. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> which of yeah. course fits because I, one of the characters I play is the internet shirt yogi, who's ah. this guy who buys shirts on the internet in order to, and then by either buying or not buying them, he, that's his path to enlightenment. So oh. still at the, still at this point, <laughs> I still just thought that this was like this guy his cat calling me and then there's this there's this lady with him a blonde haired lady and i'm like well who the hell are these people and and but i was but and then what i did was i started course pitching my own star trek show with you and did? i gave you guys you this card right and i'm like here watch my show and then finally you're like you know we, we, we got to go we got to go to our booth and i'm like well oh, okay and you're like come just come to our booth and I'll, I'll talk to you later and i'm like okay well where is it and you yeah just go to the land of the lost booth i'm like what do you mean the land of the lost booth yeah, yeah just go over there so then i'm like wait a sec <laughs> so i go over there and it turns out that this guy is wesley or <sighs> You, I'm gonna say. Sure, you. Well, you know, you're his French, so it's. That's oh. Good. 
<laughs> oh, vous parlez français, monsieur? But it's the river. See, there's the river Seine in Paris and the river Eure. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then, is, then it is you. It is you. Where's the uh, It probably uh, Okay. So, in other words, Will and Holly. The also the the lady next to him was Holly. Was Kathy Coleman? Right, yeah. Kathy it's Coleman. Only... Will and Holly from Land of the Lost. And folks, I'm old enough to have watched that show. It happened in the middle '70s, right? I, by the time I was watching it, I might have been watching reruns, which was 1975, I think. Was it? 70, that's the original. 74. Oh, I saw the original. Yeah. Okay. It's still on, by the way. So it's, it's place. All, it's crazy. It's still. It has a new fan. It's day. coming back. That's cool. But, but the and, reason, I mean, people are probably going, "Well, how? That, why is Land of the Lost at the Star Trek convention?" I know, and I also pinned you on that one. I'm like, dude. Do you, don't you realize this is a Star Trek convention? <laughs> That's the first the thing I said to when I walked only, up to the table. <laughs> we're the only show that, that that Creation Entertainment, other than the Star Trek, allows at the convention. It's because our writers and our our crew were all Star Trek. David Gerald was our head writer. He okay. wrote a couple of triples. Walter Koenig, who oh. played Chekhov, uh, created Enoch, the talking sleeve stack. DC Fontana, Larry Niven, Spinrad. We had the, we had all those writers, and then Mike Westmore created the Slee Stack. And Mike, of course, did all the makeup for the the Star Treks, and and some of our and our production staff was all Star Trek. And uh, in fact, Sid Croft said when he came up with Land of the Lost Idea, he went to this new guy over at Paramount. It was a guy named Gene Roddenberry, and said, "Hey, you want to work on Land of the Lost?" He goes, "No, I don't have time, but I've got this young writer." David like, Gerald. Gene Roddenberry. Who the hell is that? I'm, that I sounds know. familiar. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. it, it'll never <laughs> last. He'll never have a career. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's how David Gerald came on board. Because Gene uh, gave him uh, uh, a recommended to Sid Croft. And in fact, Enoch was supposed to be named Enig, which was Gene reversed in honor of Gene oh, That's Roddenberry. good. Yeah, that's good. But David said, David Gerald said, you know what? It would be funny once. And then, you know, and then it would be like, yeah. Okay. Well, since you mentioned Gene Rodimer, I might as well pitch this to you on the air so you can't say no. Yeah, I know. The answer is no. No, you have to. Well, okay. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so you know I have my, my, my uh, fan series, right? Yes. One of the things with your permission, is I would love to do a Land of the Lost episode. Because the way my show works is I take clips from old shows, like mostly yeah. Star Trek, um, the original series, and then I use a green screen and have new actors interact with old clips and turn them into something new. So I was like, you know what? I should do, I should somehow get Wesley Ur to agree to like be in this episode. And then I'll use old clips from Land of the Lost and then we'll have you do, I mean, you'll be, a, obviously, you'll, you'll be the featured cameo in the show, you know, and then whatever, we'd figure out some way to make it happen. So, so yeah. So, so what do you say? Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. I've got, I've got to leave. Listen, I'm sorry I can't do theater. You have to run. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, we would want to have. No, it, it, it sounds fun, Matt. Sounds for sure fun. we'd have Kathy in it, too. Do you guys live near each other? No, I live in Palm Springs and Mexico half the year, half and okay. half. Okay. And Kathy lives in Las Vegas. Okay, because I'll tell you how it's – okay, so now that you said yes, um, <laughs> just sign – is there a napkin you can, like, sign your – sign on the dotted line? That'll do. All right. Okay. Folks, you witnessed this. He agreed to it. <laughs> All right. And then – so <clears throat> the way I always do it is it's just green screen. So we could literally do it over Zoom. And then so we don't even have like the other people in the show, like the other co-star, the biggest co-star is JP from Egotastic Fun Time, also known as um, Talking the Orville. Okay. I live in Seattle and JP lives in Oklahoma. And we've only met in real person once, but on the show, we always just did it over Zoom. And then I, through the magic of green screens and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of editing, it makes it look like we're in the same universe interacting with each other. So we could do it. Yeah. Fun, yeah. Okay. Fun. I'm going I'm to be in Seattle in a few weeks. Really? Kathy and Phil and I 
uh, we're doing an auto, a, a private autograph a, a thing. I think at some sort of big event, a mall or something. There. Oh, uh, really? Uh, on the seventh of of March. Is it? Oh, wait. No. Hey, Why that already May. happened, my friend? Seventh May. May. Seventh of May. Seventh so, of May. So that's like. Well, of course, that's two days after. Um, the 5th of May, and everybody knows what happens on the 5th of May, right? <laughs> no, it's not Cinco de Mayo. Well, it is Cinco de Mayo, but this year, the, I created this thing. Well, you know, May the 4th of May is Star Wars Day, where everybody goes, may the 4th be with you. Sure. So this year, I've been saying, well, may the 5th be with you, because on May the 5th, Star Trek New Voyages, uh, not Stoom Voyages, Strange New Worlds comes out. The first episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds with Anson Mount comes out on eight, May 5th. Okay. Yeah. And people have been chomping at the bit for, for quite a while to see that show, including me. I even tell people... I'm a, I'm a huge Trekkie fan. Huge. Oh, okay. I've, I've been, been telling people all day today. For, for like the past two years, I've been telling everybody, you know, my favorite Star Trek is Strange New Worlds. It's just my favorite. I love it so much. <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, okay, what? It hasn't come out yet. Well, I already it's my favorite one. <laughs> anyway. So, well, that's great. So you're a Trekkie. Well, that's that's very, very, very good. Um, oh, big, big time Trekkie. Oh, my God. Since I was, you know, since it first came out, I've been just glued. Cool. And and the suddenly, you know, and I didn't really under, realize too much the, the correlation between Land of the Lost and Star Trek for years. And then we started doing these conventions and, you know, and, and suddenly everybody's coming and Mike Westmore comes and stops by every year. We talk and, and Walter Koenig always comes by our booth. That's so great. Walter has his, his little fedora hat on. Right. Uh -huh. And he walks by and he comes over and he goes. Those damn Sid Marty Croft. I should have gotten residuals for Enoch. I should have gotten residuals. Right. I, t I told Sid that the other day. Sid Croft. He goes, yeah, we're too cheap. <laughs> but I don't think they even got residuals for Star Trek. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, wow. I don't know. I don't know all that stuff. But, well, I have another thing up my sleeve. Is I've been trying to, I want to have my own egotastic Trek table this year in the vendor's room. Because I found out, I mean, I found out what you got to do, at least how much you got to pay for a table. And I'm like, I can afford that. But so far, I've been shot down. But, and the thing is, is this year, it's in a different place. So it's, a Bali. A, so, yeah. it's in the Bali. And I, I have a feeling, and I noticed that every day, it's like they invited five more guests. So I have a feeling they're trying to save space just for real Star Trek actors. So who knows, I might, I'm, my latest thing is I'm trying to get a bunch of fan film people together so that we can somehow get just a Star Trek fan film table and I could be part of that. But oh, that'd be nice. so far it's a concept, it ha we haven't actually pulled it off yet. So anyway, so your table was kind of near um, uh, J.G. Hertzler's table, remember him? Yeah, sure. And he had that pirate hat on. And he was just carrying on the whole time. So I actually interviewed him on this show too a while ago. He's quite an interesting character. So, anyways, so well, good well, luck. I'm going to be there. Table. I'm going to yeah. be there for sure. So, and and so, did you say? Did you tell me? Now I already my brain just went when you said you're going to be in Seattle when, and then did you May, decide what day May, it was? May seventh. Oh, May seventh. Yeah. May seventh. Right. I'll be around. Okay. Um, so as a, it's a private signing, so people like a, oh, it's just, going to be a public thing. I don't know what it's just us. It's just the cast of Land of the Lost. It's cool. not. Like a, it's not a convention, and we're. Okay. I think, I'm not sure all the stuff yet. I think it's at a mall or something like that. A big toy well, store. I, I know several malls. So I'm uh, not sure. Tell you what, I'm gonna. Do. <laughs> we can do it right. We can practice right now. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I was think how good your song would be if it had cello. I'm like, I love the cello. Marshall Will Holly. Wait, is that a good key for you? Can you do it solo or do you have to have your cohort with you? You know, I sang it on the on the show. That's me singing the theme song. Oh, really? Yeah. I did the, the beginning and the end. And then I went back in the studio in the third season. We changed cast and I had to re-record the song. Uh, oh, so that's why, well, you're, besides, that's, you are, I did notice on your Wikipedia page, which you have a very impressive Wikipedia page. Oh, okay. I, it's got a lot of stuff on it. 
I'm supremely jealous because I have I don't even have a Wikipedia page with a single sentence. Oh. In fact, I don't even have a Wikipedia page. Oh. That's one of my goals in life. But I discovered that you have to. You would think, think with your orchestra and everything that the charity work is the five hundred one three C that you do. You would apparently have it's not notable enough. Either that or my Wikipedia guy is like blowing smoke up at me or whatever. I should almost yeah. said a bad word. Okay, so, but your Wikipedia page does indicate that you're a singer as well as an actor. I, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of singing. I used to headline in Vegas and- Oh, uh, cool. Open, open. <laughs> this is going to be a bad word. I used to open for Bill Cosby and-, uh, and Oops. Harris. Yeah, so- uh, uh, Did you ever, while you were in Vegas, did you ever um, make friends with Tom Jones? I never did. I, I, I never did, unfortunately. I love his, his music. I think yeah. he's great. And he's like 80 years old. Is he still, he's still alive, right? Yeah. It's not unusual to, to be loved by anyone. <laughs> but, you know, we do these conventions. People get okay. so tired. They're sitting next to us because we bring, okay. usually we bring a yellow raft. Wait, go, hold on. Wait a sec. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, what key do you tend to sing it in? I have no idea. Could you hum the first note? Marshall Willard. Uh, dun, dun. There we go. Take it away, man. <laughs> okay. Marshall Will and Holly on a routine expedition at the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny rap. Ah! Plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, to the land of the lost. And then the dinosaur goes, Grumpy goes, Roar! <laughs> But my okay. favorite, my favorite is the closing theme song. And in oh, fact, in the movie Bubble Boy, Jake Gyllenhaal, his favorite show is Land of the Lost. And he actually okay. dresses like me and pretends he's me. But he rocks it out in the opening. He goes, when I look all around, I can't believe the things I found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost. I'm lost. Find me living in the land of the lost, 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 living in the land of the lost. Marty Croft. So you have a very beautiful singing voice. Oh, thanks. Wow. Do you take singing lessons now or, or did you ever? Oh, yeah. I took them. Yeah, back in the day when I was doing a lot of singing and stuff like that. Hmm. So, yeah, I used to do concerts and stuff like that. Back, cool. Back in my, my ute. Okay. Now, um, I believe you had a chance to be on the Brady Bunch, right? Yeah. I, uh, I, I was going to replace David Cassidy. He was leaving the show. He had decided he was he had done it. I forgot which, which year it was. And they didn't want the show to end. So they were going to cast. I was going to be, they were looking for a guy to play his next door neighbor, become his best friend, who was, had a single dad. And then Shirley, David was going to go up to college. Then Shirley was going to marry the guy who's going to play my dad. And I was going to become the lead singer of the party. She was going to marry the next door neighbor? Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. What, what happened to the guy that she was married to? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what was going to go on. But mm, I had that. But I went, uh, Bobby Sherman, uh, you know, from Seven Brides, Seven Brothers and stuff. So I went to Bobby's yeah. house and I recorded a song for ABC and then yeah. I had to go lip sync it for ABC and, and I got the part. And then David heard I was doing the show. He goes, no, you know what? I think I'll stay. And so the 86, that plot line. Hmm. Why are you guys like uh nemesis nemesis no, of each well, other? All, back in the day, I mean, all the team, because we all did Tiger Beat and, and teen magazines and all that 16 and things. We all knew each other. Like Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett would come swimming at my house. This is before Sean was even famous. He was just- On the he, Partridge family, right? Yeah, uh, which no, Sean was, uh, was uh, 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 Sean Cassidy, who, you oh. know, and uh, so that was David's brother. And then, of course, he became very famous. So oh, Sean Cassidy. Duh. Cassidy, okay. Duh. And he's yeah, now a big okay. director and, and writer. But, the, you know, he's come swimming at my house. And it was it was kind of a, a closed, little closed community back then. No. Okay. I was going to say, that sounds like a stage name. But if he had a brother with the same name, I guess it was a real name. David? What? David? Wait. Sean Cassidy? 
Yeah, Sean and David Cassidy. Yeah, but it sounds like a car. <laughs> you know, is that their real name or did they make that up? No, that's their name. Yeah. That's oh, okay. Name. Yeah. I wish I had a name like Cassidy. Uh, they, they, their father was a famous actor, Jack Cassidy. Cool. Okay. Well, the plot thickens. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They're terrific. David was great. You know, I mean, okay. You know, it, no, it, there was no animosity or anything back in those days. That's cool. Wow. Okay. Wow. Very, well, that's so interesting. So, um, now I want to talk about, I so well, like I said, you're, well, I, blank, I blanked out. So now I, my cheat sheet. <laughs> oh, well, now we're going to really off the cuff. Um, <clears throat> I no, did like, notice that you do a lot of, um, charity work. Uh, yeah. Like, I produce March of Dimes, I think it was. March, I used to host March of Dimes. Back in the day we had telethons. I used to be, well, I was March of Dimes number one host. I'd go for oh, you know, like Charlotte, Charlotte, West Virginia, any place. And stay for the forty-eight hours, sing and dance, and raise money, and then uh, and do wow. you know, three or four a year. And then uh, I started doing it for the Variety Club, cool, in Pittsburgh, cool. and did that for three years. And, well, of oh, course, Jerry Lewis comes to mind. Did you ever get to meet him? Yeah, in fact, I was going to open for him in, in Vegas. Oh, cool! But uh, yeah, I actually hosted uh, the Jerry Lewis Telethon out of Sacramento. You know, they okay. had the affiliates. You know, Jerry would do. The big one, the national one, and then you have local affiliates raising money. So I did okay. that for a year. But yeah, I, I produce fundraisers for for a lot of different charities, for breast cancer, for AIDS, for battered children. We you know we we raise a lot of money. Wow, so. that's neat. That's really neat. Cool. But think, yeah. And then I think well, you're gonna actually since I Mike I I'm looking at a a black a void. You know, on my I'm, iPad, you're gonna have to tell me all your stuff. Tell me about now. yourself. Now I know you. I listen. I, I see you. I listen. I love the cello. First, one of my best friends, Steve Velez. Okay. Celloist, and he has. I love. We, we met. I used to produce shows on Crystal Cruises, which just went belly up. But uh, okay. I had a company, and Steve was one of the soloists. Okay. And he's he's now directing and heading up the uh, opera in the park in Palm Springs and things like that. Okay. But he did this amazing cello, and I. Oh no, we just lost our connection. It's just pure silence and he stopped moving. Please come back. Yeah, ready. Sorry folks, we had a bit of technical difficulty. So we're back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exciting, yes. I you know that was I got, I got to go get a cup of, of iced coffee and you know, I mean Ooh, I'm, nice. Yeah. And then I got to get my iPad to work again, so now I can look at things. Now you say, know who I am. I, mean, I can say intelligent things again. <laughs> so we, we now the you know, cello. I got, to tell you, I got to tell you, Matt, the, the look on your face when you lost your screen, you're like all the information about who, what the heck I've ever done. You're like, there was the thing, you're like, it was <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I've had worse things happen to me. All right. Now, here's what's jumping out at me. Yes. There's so much stuff, I'm like overwhelmed. Okay. I see that you were the creative producer of Dragon Tales. I was. I, I co-created the show with three, three creators. Wow. I'd written a book that uh, Disney bought for an animated feature called The Red Wings of Christmas, a novel okay. I wrote. Uh, in fact, Ron Palillo, Welcome Back Cotter, played Horshack, illustrated the book. Nice. And so uh, the executive producer uh, at Sony Pictures, he called me one day. Because Red Wings of Christmas was his son's favorite book. Okay. And I've got these dragon drawings there. PBS is looking for a new series, and everybody wants it. I mean, from uh, uh, the, the uh, Sesame Street to, you know, cool. everybody. Anyway, so I went in, and they had written some stuff, and I saw the drawings and molded it. And we I wrote it in three days, and we sold it in a week. Of course. I mean, when I see executive producer on something, I'm like, yeah, right. I, I wasn't the executive director. I was the co-creator of that. Okay, so you actually, it's not like you just got your name slapped on it. You actually. No, no, no. I came up with Zach and Wheezy, the two-headed dragon. You know, I, I, those were my my characters. Oh, cool. That's cool. Okay. Well, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about, actually. Um, so the the March of Don, you weren't on Chips? <laughs> yeah. What? Oh, but no, no, just an episode. There's a celebrity episode. 
It's it's with Lake Garrett, who, who it was about him being a teen idol. But everybody in the world, there must have been thirty or forty, thirty celebrities roller skating at <laughs> at a roller rink back in the day, and we all signed a, a, a contract that we all the money would go to charity. But it was it That's was cool. so many celebrities. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I don't suppose you were ever on Hollywood Squares. I, I wasn't. I was a regular on Password. Oh, cool. Uh, with Elizabeth Montgomery, Betty White, I played. Elizabeth game. Montgomery. Oh my God, that I, I everybody taught, was in love with her. I taught Lucille Ball how to play Password. She what? spent the day with me. How about um, uh, who who's the person who plays I Dream of Jeannie? Barbara Eden. Barbara Eden. Did you I never ever... played Barbara? I did. I played with like there was Deborah Lee Scott and Susan uh, uh, Vicky Lawrence. I played against. Oh. I pretty much every, everybody. I did Match Game. You know, back in the day, I was a, I hosted my own game shows for Nickelodeon Finders Keepers. Oh, cool! The, the number one game show for a long time. Well, so you've done a lot of stuff. Wow, that's that's really neat. You see, you thought okay. I was just going to come on and be a land of the lost guy here. Yeah. Wow. Well, <clears throat> obviously, it kind of shows I didn't do a whole lot of homework before this episode. You know what? Shame on you. But that was that's that's by design because I wanted to be off the cuff, keep it interesting. <laughs> this is totally unscripted, folks. That's why when I played the cello and he sang, um, uh, it was completely had nothing to do with the song. It sounded horrible. Also, my main excuse is when you try to do that over Zoom, it's out of sync. So well, you're right. Yeah, there's can't that. be done. Yeah, exactly. So, I, uh, yeah, I forget you have to sort of delay it when you hear Marshall, Will, and Ali. To like, you just go slow. Yeah, so I have to say the cello actually rather detracted from the performance rather than added to it. Maybe we should allow you to do one, a solo a cappella one now so they know. You know how it's really Marshall, supposed to Will go. And Holly, our routine expedition met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft, ah, plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy goes, Roar! <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I had to go in, in the third season of Land of the Lost. The, we lost our dad. He he didn't sign for the third season. Uh -oh. It was a contract dispute. So we had our uncle Jack come in. So did and, he got like did he step in some quicksand and disappear forever? He went in the opening. He went into a pylon. There was a golden. Oh yeah, the pylons. Yeah. He went inside and he went back and twirled around and then our uncle Jack, his brother, came and found us. Ron Harper, who was on Planet of the Apes, and so I had to go back in the recording studio and had to re we, we had to rewrite the lyrics. So it was uh, Will and Holly Marshall, and as the earth beneath them trembled, lost their father through the door of time. Uncle Jack was searching and found the kids at last, looking for a way to escape, escape, escape from the land of the lost, from the land of the lost. Roar. Yeah. So. Okay. So obviously the land of the lost. You don't seem impressed, Matt. You don't seem impressed. Well, I'm, I'm going ahead here. <laughs> Because now my mind's already on to the next three things. Um, the Land of the Lost is obviously based on Jules Verne, right? It wasn't. I mean, the, the idea of going into the earth, journeying into the center of the we, earth. We, and, weren't, we weren't inside the earth. Well, how did you go back in time? Now I forgot how it works. We, we went through a time doorway. Oh. And we entered this world. I mean, there were... There were, you know, moon, different suns in the skies and moons. And, okay. A time and doorway disguised as a waterfall? Well, the waterfall was, was what got us into it. There was supposed, they cheaped out. You see, the, it was supposed to be in the opening credit, some sort of effect where the water, we went down the, the, the waterfall in the yellow raft. We went through something. And I don't think they ever, they never put it in. So everybody's going, what the hell is that all about? So, okay. No wonder I'm confused. Yeah. No wonder. They could have at least just had some smoke and colored lights in the smoke or something. They could have done something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Well, that's okay. It was the 70s was after all. That was David Gerald, Trouble with Tribbles. And, uh, you know. Possibly the Hannibal, best Star Trek episode there is in the original series. Right. We do. And, and David, we do a lot of panels together. And stuff like that. I'm oh, a cool. David. And 
Land of the Lost would have been just like a Swiss family Robinson, like a, a, a father and his son lost in the wilderness, surviving with, you know, all these creatures and stuff. But when David came on board because of Gene Roddenberry, okay. uh, it turned into this science fiction you know, creation. And at the time, like D.C. Fontana and Larry Niven and Walter Koenig and all these people, you know, they're at the beginning of their writing careers. And so he was able to get them for a Saturday morning show. And David always said to the writers, he always said, let's not write a children's show. We're going to write an adult show that airs on Saturday morning. Question. Yes. This is the second uh, time. Be, uh, just one second. Uh, yes, Matt, Matt. Yes. Okay, okay go ahead. Yes. Uh, Monsieur Eur. Yeah. Um, une question. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, vous parlez français, non? Uh, oui, oui. I Eiffel Tower, uh, French pastry, uh, croissant, yeah, full affluent. Okay. Well, j'aime les croissants, monsieur. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question is, this is the second time that you mentioned Walter Koenig as a writer, and I didn't even know he did that kind of stuff. So he's written and produced things? Yes, Walter's a writer. Uh I mean, he the, the, he wrote the third episode introducing Enoch. The, he was the uh, sleep sack that was the wise one that was... Uh, uh, Okay. Talk and stuff like that. And, and uh, yeah, he only wrote one episode for us, for Land of the Lost. Okay, Walter Koenig, otherwise known as Mr. Chekhov. Chekhov, yes. Star Trek. Yes. Wow, that's neat. Woo, cool. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I, still... I, I can see this, Matt, yeah. I Which actually... I when I did... When I did uh, when I did uh, Land of the Lost, I just started on Days of Our Lives. I did Days of Our Lives for about oh. a day. I played Mike Horton on Days of Our Lives. Okay, well, unfortunately, I didn't. I was too young to care anything about <laughs> soap exactly. operas. <laughs> exactly. But was he like a heartthrob type of a character? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I became a doctor on the show, and then I, I left because I was, I was, I was singing all over the place. But so after about nine years, I left the soap and. Uh, uh, and moved and moved on a bit. Okay, so let me. I'd like to actually. I'm very interested. I'm curious how daytime television works like that. So, like, I mean, you literally have to learn your lines right on the spot or that morning, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, they give you the script the night before. Okay. So you know, you only have a few hours, and it, it, the first couple of years I was on the show, I was just panicked. I mean, I have to, I, I'd finished filming like about four in the afternoon or five in the afternoon in DC, I'd go home and try to learn my lines for the next day. And you could have, you know, it was a 60 minute show. So you could have anywhere from two pages to 30 pages to memorize. Oh my God. Depending on what storyline was going on. But I'd never but about, do that. About the third year, or fourth year, it suddenly clicked in and I was able, I didn't even open the script until the morning we shot. <laughs> and I would, I would get the script. I'd go, okay. I go, I close. I go, how many? Oh, how many pages do I have to learn this morning? And and, and but I can do it before wow. uh, before rehearsal, dress rehearsal. See, I don't. I can't. Like, well, see, like what I do on my show. I literally have this script right in front of me, and I just do it line by line, and it's all. It's like. It's, like to, the idea of memorizing a script is frightening to me, and to do like what you would have to do like the night before, I I couldn't do it. But I don't know. So it just takes practice to be able to do that. Yeah, it's like a muscle. It's like it's like singing. It's you know, it's 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 a muscle. You you you, you the brain is. I don't know what happened, but I remember when they clicked in. I thought, whoa, I can do this. Wow. And it was you know, it was, sometimes it was terrible. I would literally open up and I go, oh my god, I, I, I had so many lines, and mm. and remember, I'm, I'm and and it's and within an hour or so we're filming. Right. right? And it's like okay. So how many, in something like that, how many takes do you get to do? Just one? <laughs> that's yeah. it? One take. And then it, it's just whatever performance you give them, that's well, it? If, if you really blow it, they'll stop you, but they hate it. Ooh. And in fact, back in the day, Days of Our Lives had cue cards. They don't have them anymore. But McDonald Carey was a fan. Famous. He was he was the first major movie star, B star list to be a star of a soap opera. He was the star of Days of Our Lives for many years. He's, he's long right. gone. But so you would watch the old shows of, of, of Days of Our Lives, and you could see, you know, Mac would be talking to to somebody here, and then you see his eyes wander and go. He would start to read the cue read card. Read the cue card. Okay, so at least you guys had cue cards. So every, did you have I, cue cards? I, I never once used them. I, I never did. I completely use them. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I wrote the script for my show, 
but yet when I'm an actor and the camera's turned on, I got the thing in giant letters right in front of me, you know, and sure. that's, that's all, you know, because there's so many things to think about, at least for me. Well, at least. well when you watch Saturday Night Live, because they only have a week to put together, and some yeah. of the skits, because they're topical, some of them are, are written, the, the, you know, on a Friday night, because something big happens in the news. But you, so, I, of course, on Saturday Night, you can always see them reading, you know, you always catch them reading. They're, right. they're, you know but that's really wild and then so like if you film an episode say on monday is that episode airing tuesday or is it like the next week it used to be about two weeks ahead okay so they still have time to do some post-production yeah, stuff i think they're and... further ahead nowadays uh it just got picked up again so there's only like three left soap operas hmm it's going, it's going away. Bold and beautiful is still there. I think General Hospital is there. Maybe all, maybe Young and the Restless. Okay, cool. Wow. Last night I threw a big birthday party for Greg Mark. So what happens if like, what if you got like really sick, like you got the flu or something? What would they do? Well, they would, if, and that rarely happened, by the way. People okay. didn't miss it. But if you got, somebody got really sick, they would, because you have two weeks ahead, they would take those scenes out and refilm them another day and pop them in. Okay. You know, so, I mean, they, they'd have to. So, but it, it, I don't even remember it ever happening, to be honest. And that's really? nine years. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. Okay. Yeah. Wild. But, uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, ew. I remember, I remember Kelly Ripa. Uh, when uh, before she was Kelly Ripper, before she was on the Regis show, you know, Kelly, uh, uh, it is Kelly, yeah, Kelly Ripper, right? Yeah, wait. wait, Kelly, everybody knows who Kelly is, yeah, Kelly, Kelly, the, the old, the, uh, the, the old Regis co host, right? Yeah, Kelly. So she was playing <laughs> a nurse on Days of Our Lives, she had an under five, which meant she only had less than five lines, and I remember, I remember this day, she, she's talked, to, she's talked about it, but she was playing this nurse. And she was in one of the first scenes and she filmed her scene and she she went to her dressing room and she got out of makeup and she left and they wanted to refilm it. And they were going, uh, Kelly Ripa, Kelly Ripa. And she left the building. She left NBC. And they were, I mean, they were screaming. They were so mad at her. And they <laughs> fired her that night. They fired her that that was in her. Oh, her because she, so she left in a huff. She was mad at her. No, or something? no, she didn't sign out. She didn't check out. Oh. You, know, you can't leave until you, know, you get a clearance to leave that they're not going to need you anymore. But, uh, you know, soap operas are fun because the guy who played my dad once, um, they used to do the soap operas live. Right. Back in the day. So they were, you know, like dark shadows and stuff. They were all filmed live. And he, he was a doctor and he had a dress rehearsal. He was washing his hands, a surgeon, he was washing his hand and he was talking about the surgery and there were all these technical medical terms. So he said, I'm not gonna memorize them. So he took a, a, a pencil with, uh, it was one of those- uh, um, Mechanical pencils? It wasn't mechanic, it was, uh, it had like a, a wax, kind of a waxy stuff. Oh, a and grease it, pencil. Grease pencil. Yeah. And on the basin, he wrote all the, you know, the, <laughs> the tonsillectomy of the tricorder of the, whatever it was, the order <laughs> of this, right? So in dress rehearsal, you know, he, he, he turns on the water. And it's just sound effects of water because they're filming up here. And he, right. you know, he's washing his hand. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah the tricorder, the things, the things. Well, what they decided after dress rehearsal, they said, you know, it would look better if we had real water. Oh no! <laughs> and now this is live, live. <laughs> so he doesn't know it's up to water. So he turns on the the, the faucet, and suddenly the, the basin is filling up. <laughs> he's like, and the letters <laughs> are now floating. Go and he, he's going, and the trifecta, <laughs> and he's speeding as they're going down the drain, and they're circling the drain. <laughs> Now, this was before or after the land of the lost. Oh, this, well, this, this, I was not at then. This was okay. when the TV shows were live. But back in the day, the soap operas, there were so many funny things. There was one actor who was famous during this one actor. And he was, you know, people would die on a Friday on the soap opera because then it was the cliffhanger, right? Right. So this one, this one guy, they were killing him off. He was not happy. So right. the last scene of the day, it's, it's live. He's dying. And it's like a, Du, 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 you know, and, you know <laughs> he's died and the camera zooms in and he wakes up <laughs> and 
and it, and it's a miracle. And it's the end of the, I mean, it's Friday show. They're screaming and yelling at him. How dare you? They made him come back on Monday to refilm it. He wouldn't die. He refused to he, die. He refused to die. They kept bringing you back. He would come back to life. So I guess about this third or fourth day, they finally just opened the door of the hospital room and goes, he's dead. He's <laughs> dead, Jim. <laughs> But those days of live TV, I mean, amazing. Oh, boy. Like doing, um, the, like doing the talk shows back in the day we used to do, you know, uh, and they were so much fun. Yep. Well, this is sort of a talk show. It is. Well, this is. This Technically, is cool. it's not live because we're pre-recording it, but we pretend it's live. It's got that live energy to it. So, <laughs> wow, that's so cool. So... Okay, let's go way to present. So I'm going to scroll down past all these accomplishments, and the last thing I see is Sins of Our Youth. Steve Kaplan. Yeah, that was that all about. Well, more recently, I did a movie with William Shatner and Christopher Lloyd. Oh, cool. See, see the Star Trek connection kind of keeps coming back, doesn't it? Wow. Christopher Lloyd, I love him. I do too. So we, uh, I was at a restaurant in Palm Springs and this guy comes up to me at a Mexican restaurant. And he goes, you're Wesley, you're, aren't you? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I'm producing this movie with Shatner. I want you in my movie. <laughs> exactly. See, I can relate to that. Hey, Wesley, yeah. you're going to be in my Star Trek fan film, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a slightly different count. Now, does anybody call you Wes, Wes, or is it always Wesley? Mostly Wesley, yeah. Okay. Wesley. I, I mean, I don't care. But uh, that's easier for me because there is another Wes that I want to interview someday. His name is Wes Chatham. You ever heard of him? I have. Us Wes is a rare creature. So we, we kind of, that when, when somebody says that name, it rings a bell. You know, you hear it. It is. It's a cool yeah. name. I yeah. like it. It's cool. It's kind of like. When I, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm an old guy. So when I was a kid, Wesley was a very, you know, it, back in the day, it was like, you know, John Wesley. It was a, like a religious name or something like that. Uh, but. I no one no I never met another Wesley until I was come to North. think of it. There was a kid in fourth grade named Wes, and everybody thought he was the coolest kid basically because he had the coolest name. Oh wow. Wes. Yeah. I mean but it's like that, wait, Matt, you haven't finished the Shatner movie. So this oh, yeah, yeah. Movie, it's called Sins of Our Youth, by okay, the way. Yeah, yeah. It came out last year. All right. And my claim to fame, well, I mean I just have a cameo in it, so I, I don't do a lot of it. Okay. But, uh, but my thing is that is that Christopher Lloyd's phone broke, you know, on the set. And I said, oh, I, I know the repair shop here in Palm Springs. Give me your phone. He took his phone and I took it to the repair shop, the Apple store. It was a, a local Apple place, not an Apple dealer, but just a repair shop. And I got the phone fixed and took it back to him. And you copied all his contacts, right? I, of course. I, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, then, then you must. I'm sure you're a Back to the Futures fan too. Besides just Star Trek, right? As a matter of fact, <laughs> more stories. I just did a convention in Dallas, and the other stars were Land of the Lost and Back to the Future. And Mayor Gordy was there, and uh, you know, we had three of the cast members from Back to the Future. Yeah, I, I love Back to the Future. My gosh. Yeah, that's neat. But that's the fun thing about doing these, these conventions, you know. It's not just, you know, it's not just meeting fans and, and, and hearing stories and stuff, but I get to meet my heroes. I mean, Dirk Schaefer, right. like Dirk Schaefer, uh, uh, Dirk Benedict was uh, was one of the other stars that was signing, you know, and from A-Team. I mean, I loved him on A-Team when I was you know, growing up. But I was, I sometimes I like I've sat next to uh, Lou Ferrigno for five days. Oh, cool. Dragon Con. And, you know, but you get to meet and, and, and not just meet, but get to spend time with and, and go to dinner with, you know, some people that, Oh, you know, as you know, I, I'm like a fanboy. I'm just like, I can't believe I'm getting to meet these people. Like for my favorite show growing up was Lost in Space. Oh, I know the show, yeah. So, and and a few weeks ago, I sat next to Marta Kristen. Marta played Judy in cool. Lost in Space, and you know, and, and we've done shows with Billy Mooney and, and Angela Cartwright. But, you well, know, but I just I'm just a fan. I'm just a Gaga. Like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm sitting next to you. That's cool. That's really cool. Well, there's a there's an oblique reference to Lost in Fate Space in episode four of my show that I'm currently working on, and that I use that sound when people disappear in Lost in Space. There's that oh. type of sound. 
When you hear it, you're like, oh, that's the Lost in Space sound. Okay. It took me quite a while to find it. I had to really search on the internet to find it. But I got it. So you'll you'll catch that. Nice. Wow. So, <clears> hmm. <throat> Lost in Space. Um, I'm guessing you really dug Get Smart, too, right? I did. Da -da 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 -da. Did, did you ever get to meet Don Adams? I didn't, but the co-star... Uh, uh, 99? 99. Did you so, ever go out on a date with her? I did not go on a date, but I was I was uh, a guest star on a pilot for a new game show. Ooh. And Barbara Feldon was, there were four guest celebrities and Barbara right. was next to me. And I remember my favorite moment was in the show. It was uh, in the two contestants and the host. And it was, I forgot which network it was for. Right. It was something and some clue. And I, I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. I took my shoe off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting next to Barbara Feldman. I'm going, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. H uh -huh. I said, H99, it's for you. <laughs> she looked at me. She was like, she started laughing. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's super cool. But it's yeah. the, you know, it's the fun of getting to play with some of my heroes. I mean, I'm from right. Hattiesburg. I'm from Mississippi. I was a kid from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. You know, and nobody in my family were entertainers. They're all professors. Okay. And, you know, so sometimes I mean, you know, I look around and go, "How the hell did I end up here?" It's incredible. I mean, it's you know, it's like. Well, how did you? Tenacious, just being tenacious, you know. And I, my dad left, I think my dad left when I was two and never came back. Okay. I remember reading that. And I think that, I think we all are drawn to things where what we need the most in our lives. And to be really honest, I think I probably just needed attention. I felt, you know, I, I was, I love my dad. I remember him very well. From and two years old? Yeah. I have really, I can remember from one year old. I can really? remember. Yeah. I can remember most everything. Really? And wow. I, that's yeah. amazing. It's I yeah I can I obviously didn't have the vocabulary but I know the images and all that sort of thing. Really, and, wow! Yeah, and I think we you know I, I I think that's one of the reasons I I, I became an actor. You know, I, I I craved attention or something. I guess, but huh. any state I probably would have been a car mechanic. <laughs> so you wow, never okay. know in life. You know what's going to happen. What whatever th is thrown at, at you. I mean, we all have our our stories. And right. how whatever comes at you, you know, we adjust and that's that influences who we become and what we do. Right. So did um did you find yourself um gravitating to people that were sort of a father figure for you? I don't think so. I, and that's odd, I know. I, I became so I was like my you know, I was I, I was I was kind of the guy that was taking control of everything. You know, I put my mom through law school. I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, Wait, I'm how old, how old were you when you did that? 22. So had you, did you, and how are you making money? Were you already making money as an actor or? Oh yeah. Yeah. I had a couple of TV, I had two series. Oh, duh. Of yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, read, <laughs> would you just read the Wikipedia for God's sake? Yeah. Uh, well, duh. I mean, you were in Land of the Lost when you were like 16, right? I was actually 21. Okay. I looked younger, okay. but, uh, uh, you know, and, and I got the, I got the job. It was so weird. I mean, I didn't audition for it. I, um, I went to a pool party at Sid Cross house. A friend of mine knew Sid. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not what you do. It's not what you know. It's who, you know, right. And, yeah. I go, Apparently. To I, I go to Sid's <laughs> house. I'd never met him before. And it's a lovely day. And he comes up to me and says, listen, I got a new show. You're perfect for this. Here, take this name. Oh, this is the casting director. Call her on Monday morning. It was like Saturday. And I right. called her Monday morning. I went in and, and they said, it said, it said recently, he said, you walked in and that was it. NBC said, yeah. that's the guy. Did he even say any lines? I don't even remember. Kathy, yeah. uh, Kathy who you met, right. uh, we were teasing you walking down the hall. Uh, Kathy auditioned. I think I auditioned her six times. She she came back. Really? Oh, yeah. you got to audition your co-star? Yeah. Wow. So you were like already ascending the the ladder of uh, whatever. Was, <laughs> and the guy and the guy uh, Spencer Milligan played my father, or, or Kathy and I father, and he looks so much like me. And the reason he looks like me is because they cast around me to right. make the guy look like my dad. Okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, 
I guess it's obvious, but it, it was a bit of a, a new realization for me. Like, I mean, you go to acting school or you have an acting coach or whatever, and you learn the technique of acting. But then, at least as far as TV goes, it's like, it's not like we need somebody that's got an incredible acting technique. It's no, they always are trying to find the person that's basically, they're already that that character, right? And then they get that person and that's how, so it's all in the casting, right? So yeah, like, like if you become a superstar, it's not like you're the greatest actor in the world. It's just that you have something, you have some magic that people really like that's just sort of intrinsic to you. And then you become like this. And then hopefully once you become popular, then you, you, you go and get a good acting coach. And if your acting isn't quite up to it, you bring it up, <laughs> you know? My, yeah. my favorite casting story is Henry Winkler. Oh, uh, yeah. The Fonz. Do you know the story about him being cast? Is the, um, the breakdown, which, which uh, uh, they were looking when they were auditioning, looking for cast members. Uh, it, it was this six foot two sort of, you know, uh, Italian guy, um, a mafioso kind of a guy could play the Fonz. And the casting director, his manager, his manager called into a casting director and said, listen, I've got this guy, Henry Winkler. You know, he's like five foot eight or seven, whatever Henry is, he's smaller. And he says, but he plays six feet tall. <laughs> and they brought him in and they, it was, it, that's not what they were looking for, but he was so amazing. And when he read it, it was his part. And so did he, did he already have like, hey, like uh, what's happening here? You know, like, uh, whoa, hey. <laughs> did he already I would, have I that? Assume, yeah, man, I would assume he did. Uh, <laughs> and he got the part. But I mean, so sometimes, you know, they don't even know what they're looking for. But that's, right. you know, and everybody that's cast, because I, I also produce and direct shows and things like that. Do you know all about this? Yeah. But but you, you, you hope, you really hope that the next person that walks through that door is the person. They'll blow you away and they'll make the words that you've written or the show you're going to direct better than you could have done it without them. Okay. You look for that magic that, that makes your project sparkle. Right. Okay. Let me ask you this. So like the, I mean, of course I got to talk about my show cause I got to sort of subtly bring it in and pitch it, of course. But <laughs> like my show is, it's, it's, it's a fan series, super low budget, but these days because of computers and stuff, you can do amazing things on almost no money. But my deal is, I'm the opposite. I go around and I ask people or I see people and I say, would you like to be in my show? And then if they say yes, then I find out what their talents are. Like, can they sing or can they play the guitar or whatever? And then I learn about them. And then I start creating their character and the script around that person. So it's the opposite of what you just described, where you you try to find the person that fits your, your deal. In my case, I can't do that because I obviously it's all super low budget and I don't have a casting director or anything like that. So I have to do it the other way, but it still works. It's fun to actually write to the actual actor and to their strengths. Yeah. And, and, and it, it's nice because you have a leg up on it because they already have a persona. They already have something that, you know, you're just going to hopefully embellish. And right. uh, you know, so yeah, so that's really wild. So let me ask you this. So you, do you find um, when you're producing a show, so you also direct, right? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, when, and you write scripts and stuff. So when you, when you do your shows, do you insist that they, they, their lines are exactly what's on the page or do you give them some leeway? Oh, no. I, yeah. I, it, it, well, it depends on the project. It depends on how specific it is. Okay. But, uh, listen, I have always been for any job, not just for acting, but for anybody. An employer's job is to hire the right people and let them do what they do. And that's, you know, whether you're working for Google or you're working, you know, at a car dealership, you know, and don't micromanage. But as, a, you know, when I'm writing or when I'm, I'm directing or whatever, I want them to make what make it better right surprise me see hopefully you'll see something that i didn't see and that's the excitement i you know i i, I go to you know you go readings and stuff like that with plays and french plays 
that, that, are, uh, that are doing some, you know, uh, cold readings or whatever. But you suddenly get a performer that takes a part and suddenly it's magic. You know, I, I did a reading uh, in Los Angeles with Sally Struthers and a whole bunch of other uh, like, uh, oh, my gosh, everybody was everybody was in it from Earl Holloman to uh, Joanne Worley and stuff. We were all reading this play written by Jackie Joseph. But Sally, you know, and you remember Sally from All My Children. I'm not all my children. I got all in the family. I got so proud of us. She took those words. And generally, I was belly laughing. I read the script, but I didn't find it funny. But okay. when, when she spoke those words and the way she interpreted it, it's amazing. That thing came alive. And it was, you know, so it's, it, there is a difference in, in talent and what talent can bring to a project. Right. Yeah. So then are you, um, do you find like, are you able to, like, what do you do if you have an actor that you're stuck with and you're like, you know, this person really isn't doing it. Are you able to somehow pull out what you want from them or, or what do you do in that kind of a situation? Well, that's, that's the job mm -hmm. as a director is to make them the right person and help right. them find their way. Cause hopefully that you've chosen them or you've been getting, sometimes you don't, you're, you're given an actor, you don't have a choice. Right. Hopefully they were, they got there <laughs> unless they're paying the bills and it's, you know, it's, a, <laughs> yeah. it's a, as, unless they wrote the play and their mother's financing the project and there's nothing you can do about it. And you just go, okay, well, let's, uh, this is never <laughs> lie, but you know, just give me the paycheck or whatever. <laughs> when we'll we finish Thursday night, but, um, you know, hopefully you bring it out that that's your job as the director. Okay is to help them find those nuances and things like that. And since you're an but actor that's yourself. The, that's the job of any boss. And not just, you know, again, it's every boss. is a, that's, that's the best thing a boss can do is to make somebody shine. Right. Encourage them. Yeah. Yeah. That's courage, but guide them. Give them the tool. Right. Give them, you know. Like them. watering a plant. You give them the water and the sunshine and let them grow type of thing yeah but the problem is if you overwater it you give them too much too many notes and after you give them re line readings and stuff like that you, you kill them you you take their creativity away too much water just okay. give them enough just to make them find their own path cool. it doesn't always work but hopefully it does that's neat okay um new question so have you done any shakespeare in your life or i started as a shakespearean actor in new york ah. At the American Shakespeare Festival at Stratford, Connecticut. Oh, great. That was, I was doing, a, it was my first professional job. I was 18. I auditioned in New York. I didn't know. I, I'm from Mississippi. Right. And, uh, and, and I didn't know what, what it was. And, and you had to audition. It was the School of Juilliard. They were, it was their, their they were, Michael Kahn, who was the head of Juilliard, was, was directing, and, and it was all Juilliard people. And I, I, I go to the library in New York and I get to do two pieces and I, I didn't know Shakespeare. I, so I said sonnets, I'll do a sonnet, I guess. I, and uh, I, I, I learned those sonnets and I, I'm told I didn't do it very well. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed. Do you know that one? I, the only reason I know it is because I've been working on it. But yeah, okay. anyways. But, so, wow. So, so how does I still you wait, really have I gotta wait, hold on a second, Matt. One second. <laughs> so I go, I I go and audition. And later on I asked Michael Kahn once I got the job, I said, why did you hire me? He said, Wesley, you blew Shakespeare. You were horrible. He said, but you made us laugh. And we said we had to spend the summer with this guy because it was nine months of work. So I was doing Ariel in the Tempest. Okay. Uh, I was understudy with uh, Morris okay. Kornowski, with Seda Thompson, all these major actors at the time. So I go the first day of rehearsal. We rehearsed in New York for a, a month. And then we went and performed for eight months. And I, got, I was on stage the very first day. And I go, oh, hail, grave master, grapes of hail. I come to answer that beck and call. <laughs> Be it to fly and swim. And they go, what's <laughs> Not on our stage. I go, what's wrong? And they go, you're <laughs> I go, what accent? 
<laughs> and they said that, that Liz Smith, this famous linguist from England, she worked, she was a teacher at Juilliard, and she worked with me every day. Instead of running and jumping, I had to go running and jumping, jumping, ghosts, hosts. And she was terrified. Everybody was scared of it. I was just really scared of her. She was the linguist for a movie called Julia years ago, a famous movie. Okay. The last night at uh, Stratford, uh, it was we had an actress pub, and she was getting a little tipsy up in the actress pub. And she came up to me. She said, "Mr. Dolly, she said the most regrettable experience I've had this entire season at Stratford has been to make you lose that wonderful accent." So is it gone forever? Huh? Is it gone forever? Well, unless I get tired of a little drunk, <laughs> but uh, it'll, it'll kind of slip in. But yeah. You know, and, and thank God. I mean, that was my first, you know, my first professional job. And, it, you know, it got rid of my Southern accent so I could play the roles. That's cool. Wow. So, okay, well, that begs another question. Have you heard um, Shakespeare done and what now, what certain people think the the actual accent they used at the time was? Yeah, Appalachian. Yeah, it's wild. Isn't it? Well, it was, you know, the Appalachian community, community has been so isolated for several hundred years and they came over from England. And so they've been isolated. So that dialect is what they believe was, was the accent from the Shakespearean time. You know, that up the upper crust thing that, oh yes, oh, you know, fa, fa, fa. that's an effect that happened, you know, over the years, it wasn't original. It wasn't the upper crust didn't talk like that back in the day. Right. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, it really proper is. British. Yeah, I'm actually. I have a really good dialect coach that I've been working with for quite a while. Who the guy's a genius, and he's he takes it super seriously, and he's he takes it all apart, you know, all the science of it. He knows, I'd say, any accent under the sun he can do for one thing, and then he he can tell you everything about that accent that creates it. It's just fascinating. Wow, so, that's, yeah. that's a huge skill. Yeah, Jim Johnson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Jim Johnson and his wife, Carolyn Johnson. They have this thing called the AccentHelp.com, I think it's called. I just found it. I Googled them and then figured out a way to get – well, basically, I signed up for private Zoom lessons. Wow. Uh, anyway, he also what, does Shakespeare. What, what, He's a great what, actor, too. What was the reason for that, Matt? Why, 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 what accent are you trying to work on? Um. Well, at the time, I was doing some – I was basically I've I'm a newbie at acting. I've only been I have about a year of training, okay? And um my acting coach, my original acting coach, um who's a actually a Star Trek celebrity, but he <laughs> I told him I wouldn't tell I wouldn't really say that he was my coach because he said I was so terrible and I didn't want his name associated with me. Oh, <laughs> so no. I don't really say who it is. But Did he really, really say school. that to you? Yeah, he's really old school. Like his his approach to teaching is to completely destroy the actor, tear, tear apart your ego and, and just lay waste to you so that there's nothing left. And then once there's nothing left, now we can start and build you back up. So he was still in the process of trying to lay waste at me. So I get lectured about how I'm like a an egomaniac and a narcissist, and I uh, nothing that's coming from me is authentic. It's all fake. It's all put on. I want to hear the real Matt. And then I come back and like, well, I don't even know who the real Matt is. Okay, you know, like <laughs> now we're in a serious philosophical discussion. <laughs> and he's like, that's a bunch of woo woo. I don't believe any of that crap. Well, and I'm like, well, I do. So we get into these huge arguments. Anyway, so at some point, uh, we started out doing Shakespeare. And um, so he had me do a few sonnets. And then at one point, I started doing Shylock for, from Merchant, Merchant of Venice. And um, in fact, I sent him uh, a recording of it the other day. And his response was, it's terrible. It sucks. It sounds just as bad as it did three months ago, you haven't learned anything, you know, when are you going to finally <laughs> take this seriously, blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, I kind of, we kind of departed, but surprisingly, just this past day, we started sending us each other emails again, and now we, we may start doing Zoom calls again. Anyway, enough of that. At some point, he wanted me to stop. You're going to make me cry. This is terrible. I, I, 
<laughs> okay, well, the, I think you should be proud when you're telling me this. It's you know, and how do you feel about that, Matt? And, uh, you I know. Well, uh, well, well, like, well, 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 well. Okay, it goes back to when my dad was an alcoholic and <laughs> bipolar, but I loved him anyway. And then he died two years ago, and but I still have his book of poems and. This is all true, by the way, even though I'm making fun Wait, of it. Are you, are you telling me the truth? Yeah. But I'm making fun of it, but it's actually true. Anyhow, um, so let's go back. Uh, somehow the question was, um, why was I learning an accent? Okay, so my first ever acting coach um, was teaching me. We were doing a lot of Shakespeare, but he was getting fed up with me. So um, he finally said, forget it. Let's do this Arthur Miller play. Um, oh God, I forgot the name of it. Under the Bridge. Does that sound familiar? It's about a guy named Eddie who's working on the waterfront and he has a daughter. He's, he's in love with his stepdaughter. It's, it's a really wild play, actually. And anyway, I was supposed to play Eddie. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to be Eddie, I got to learn how to talk with a Brooklyn accent. All right. That's how I'm going to talk from now on. You got that, Wesley? Are you listening to me? Hey, yeah, 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 right. yeah, 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 yeah. So I got to talk like that now, right? So that's why I decided. And then one day my teacher says, you know, you completely suck. Your accent's stupid. And a real actor would have a, actually have a dialect coach that would coach him on that kind of stuff. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go get a dialect coach. So I did. Anyway, eventually we kind of parted ways my my original teacher and then i just started working with my dialect coach and at some point my dialect coach kept telling me the same thing but in a little bit nicer way <laughs> and he said you know matt right now it makes you know you you're good at these dialects but actually there's a lot of just basic acting stuff that we, you could really benefit from and i also teach acting and i'm like oh okay let's just switch the lessons from dialects to acting so that's what we've been doing. And um, it's really fun. The whole thing's fascinating. I mean, I think, well, as you know, acting is so fascinating because it's so much learning about how people's emotions work and how human beings work. And you get to discover more about yourself, you know, and, and what I found, see, for me, the thing that I really got off on is I like to create characters and become the character. So I guess it's sort of method, method acting, I guess. It's my own home-baked version. And for me, it was really liberating to become these characters. Like I got this character named Cowboy Matt. <laughs> you know, like... Uh... You know, when I'm Cowboy Matt, I'm like, wait a minute here. So what do you say, Wesley? Uh... What do you got? What do you want to talk about? Huh? It's Cowboy Matt here. Okay. I got my gitter. How big oh, yeah. I got it for Christmas. Anyway, so I like doing that because just becoming a different character, it was really liberating, especially when I, if I was in like a, a space where I wasn't too happy with my life, if I could become somebody else, that was really fun. But what I discover, at least in the way acting is these days, that's supposedly a no-no. You're not supposed to totally become something else. You're supposed to really become just a slightly different aspect of who you really are. But I'm like, I don't want to be me. The whole point of me acting is so that I can become somebody else. And I still don't believe it. So, but anyway. Why are we talking about me? This show is supposed to be about you. <laughs> so what's your take for on me, that? For me, Matt, the whole point of acting is for others to believe that you are somebody else. Okay. Not for you. You don't need to believe it. Okay. It's acting. Well. There's a great, there's a great, what was it? What was the story? What was, a, oh my God, Marathon Man. Was it Dustin Hoffman? And. Are you talking about Rain Man? No, no. I think it was Gilgood, one of those, one of the old, you know, really actors, actors. And Dustin Hoffman had a scene the next day. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. 
Yeah, no. Tell it, tell it, then. No, I, I, it's um, shit. I think it was Peter O'Toole. Was it Peter O'Toole? Okay. Yeah, but go ahead and tell the story. No, tell it, tell it. You no, it. you're going to tell it better. Nobody wants uh, to hear what I say. Yeah, you tell it. Look, if you're watching this show, would you rather hear it from Matt Weiss? Or do you, would you rather hear it from Wesley Ugh? I personally would rather hear it from Wesley Ugh. So the point of the story was that Dustin Hoffman the next day, his scene was that he had been, you know, he was a drunk and he'd been out partying and he was a mess. So he comes in that morning to film that scene and he's a mess. And he's either Peter Tool or I said, he's a dear boy. What's, what's going on? with you he goes oh man well i'm, I'm filming the scene today and you know uh, so i stayed up all night and i've been drinking and stuff and and, and you know to get in, in, in the role and peter o'toole or he said dear boy why don't you just act right you know in other words you don't need to do all of that right you, you gather from your history and and observations and you know and that's your you know that's that's how that's you are do. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, I get it. I do. And of course, I mean, if it's going to be authentic, it's got to have at least some of you in it, right? Yeah. I mean, well, ha, yeah, I, I, I would assume so. Yeah. yeah. We all have to, I mean, you have to be believable. Right. So, I mean, yeah. I remember uh, I, I did a movie, I started in a movie called Toolbox Murders. It was the first time I played a killer in a sci-fi movie, and not in a slasher movie. And uh, in fact, it just came out on, on Blu-ray and I did the, the, the behind the scenes of it recently. But filming that, I, I went into the darkest space because was he's a sick, he's a really sick character. Okay. And I went into, it took me about two weeks after the film. We only shot for like 15 days. It was a quick shoot. And then I went back to do Days of Our Lives. And playing this good, you know, wonderful, soon to be doctor. But there was a darkness that I had sucked into my life to bring this character to life. Mm -hmm. And I, I understood, like, like you know, you look at, at Heath Ledger, you know, Joker, that kind of went, seems to have gone off the deep end. And you, it, it, you do bring in some of the reality into your life. But that reality is pr probably part of you, right? You know, that I have that darkness in me. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, we all have that. Right. But I think tapping into that and giving it permission to <laughs> be front and center, you know, without editing it, I think it just touched into something really kind of uh, strange to say. Right. Yeah. Well, I can. My experience of that is when I was doing this play and I was doing my Brooklyn accent. Um. I was starting to talk, practice my Brooklyn accent during the day and talking to my wife like that. And she really hated it, of course. And she's like, well, who the hell is this madman in my house? I want my real husband back. So there's an example. Because there was a whole attitude that came along with that accent, right? So. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it, it does. But, you know. You know, it, for me, I, you know, it, when you're I, at least when you're beginning acting, I wouldn't worry so much about the accents. Right. I wouldn't worry about telling the truth and having yeah. people believe you no matter what you sound like. But they just to believe the character. You can always add on a costume and, and an accent. But unless the core of you isn't believable, then what's the point? There's nothing to it. Yeah. Nothing. You know, so if, just be real. And, and the accents when you know will come later because. You probably only need the Brooklyn accent once. The next show will be, you know, be something else. We Midwestern, or you know, so don't lock into. I would at least. I'm mean, just my my feelings. I mean, right. is find the truth of 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 yourself in that part and make right. it believable to to whomever's watching, and then that's the goal. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> speaking of goals, um, do you have any uh, productions in the hopper right now, or any? plans of doing stuff or? i do i have a i've been executive producing a new ghost show reality show we, oh. we we for three years we've been working on it and uh sci-fi network bought it and then that kind of a little screwy so uh, it's with the ghost hunter out of seattle 
He owns a business called Spooked in Seattle, down, down <laughs> down. and a scientist named Chad Goodwin. And we combined, it's how do you prove touch? People say, oh, I got touched, how, I prove touch. And you what? How do you prove touch? You mean the feeling of touch? Somebody says in ghost hunting. Okay. Somebody says I, I, I was touched by a ghost. I was oh, broke. Okay. I was fondled. I was cut. How do you prove that that really happened rather than the person going, oh, my God, there's a cold breeze. So we've enlisted this amazing scientist named uh, Chad Goodwin. He's this young guy. He actually has the, um, he has the patent on the, the, the flux capacitor. And, but he has three companies. He's an amazing scientist. And Ross Allison, who's the ghost hunter, is author of, I think he's 12 books now, okay. lectures all over the world, and actually came and did a ghost hunt in Seattle at the Turner Joy. Uh, it was a boat uh, from uh, Vietnam War. We, we did a, a, a overnight. But anyway, so we've been filming, and it's called Paris since The Naked Experiments. And Ooh, it's scary. It's very, and we just premiered, it became, we turned it into a documentary. In, as opposed to a series and it just last week was in portland at a theater to open a ghost conference and we're looking at a theater in seattle now to maybe come and do it uh, around may 7th when i'm in town uh huh. it's extraordinary what this is it's it's parasense the, the naked experiments and it's you can okay it, but it's it's amazing <clears throat> so i'm executive producing that so i'm assuming you believe in ghosts i do have you ever had an experience of yes. such a thing Big time. I went, uh, when my mother passed away, mm -hmm. I had my mom in Palm Springs at an assisted living home. And it was the last night of her life. And she's out of it. She's morphemed up. And I'm sitting at the foot of her bed, massaging her feet. Mm -hmm. And it's about two in the morning and everybody's left. I'm just going to stay the night. And I'm massaging her feet. And suddenly it's about... I look up and, and her mother, my grandmother, is standing next to me. And I stand up and I look and I turn around and I start to laugh. I go, mother, your mother was just here. I think I want a movie of the week. And my mother had died. Right then. Right then. <sighs> At that very moment, my phone rang. And it's two, like two in the morning. And a friend of mine calls from my house and he says, your sister just called me from Atlanta. Now, this is Palm Springs, California. She was in Atlanta working on a movie. She's a production uh, financier. And, she's, and my sister said to my friend, said, what just happened? Mother came to my room and said goodbye. Exactly. Did, she know, did no. she know that your mother was sick? Well, yes. Yeah, she, of course, she knew that mom was sick. Okay. But, but she, the moment my mom, my grandmother came, I saw her full. I, I literally stood up, turned around, and my mom was gone. And my and the phone rang as my sister had called said mom just came to say goodbye yeah and that's one of them that's one of my experiences well so, I, I was actually my sister my younger sister died about 10 years ago and she was in a coma for a week and i um somehow i i had the idea that i want to be there at the moment that she dies no matter what so i um i camped out in the hospital the whole time and stayed with her all the way. And I, I was there the moment she died. I, I watched it happen. She was in a coma the whole time. But um, so I can relate to that, though. My experience was, uh, it's actually really, I mean, I cried. It was sad when she finally died. But also, um, I had this experience that once my sister died, that she was also bipolar. My both my my dad was bipolar and my sister was, and both of them. My dad was alcoholic too, and my sister was alcoholic and did lots of drugs. So they, in a sense, if I want to be brutally honest, when she died, in a sense, it was kind of a relief because all the chaos that she created in our family came to an end after that, right? And um, that that I mean, of course. <laughs> Um, but here's the thing is when she died, I had the feeling that all the the pain and everything, all the troubles in her life died with her body. But then there was like this golden light that just kind of emerged and kind of went into me and passed into me 
that was like her real soul. And I had the weirdest experience where I, it was like, like my sister's my guardian angel. And so like everything, all the crap was gone, but all the goodness of her, because of course she had all this trouble, but like many people like that also have this amazing creative side to them that's so inspiring and that everybody loves, right? And so all that was there and it kind of lived on and through me. And like, even now I feel like connected to her, like she's like with me all the time, but it's like this guardian angel. Mm. And the thing that's so weird is like during my life, she was my younger sister and most of my life and most of my childhood, I was like insanely jealous of her. I always had to be better than her. And I always, it was just, it was crazy actually that how jealous I was of my sister because she was, all she wanted is for her older brother to love her and, you know, accept her, but I could never do it because I was so jealous. It's weird. Luckily I got over most of that in the last few years that we had together, we um, got along well and I could actually be a brother for her for once in her life. But it's it's so weird now to think that my little sister that I used to be jealous of is now like this golden light that's this healing creative spirit that's always with me, protecting me. You know, so it's really, it's something. So, I mean, I'm starting to tear up, but it's not really tears of sadness. It's more like, almost like tears of joy, because I just really just feel the love and who this person really is. So, <laughs> yeah, that's also how I, and I, the same thing with my dad. Luckily, um, we went through all kinds of crap because he was, he did all kinds of crazy shit, you know, in his life. But luckily, again, the last few years of our lives, we kind of got over that. And I would, I was always with my dad. I would always visit, visit him at the uh, nursing home or the group home and stuff. So uh, by the time he finally died, we, he loved me and I loved him. And we had this great connection. And, and also, he, like I said, when I was kind of clowning around earlier, I have this set of poems that he wrote and these little stories that he wrote that just perfectly capture all the good, interesting, creative, fun part of my dad. You know, again, that I can always, I can look a poem, I can go back and read a poem and it just immediately evokes that, that best part of my dad that I, that I love so much as a kid and that I want to remember. So it's, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, but to me, I don't consider that ghosts. That's more like just people's soul. So like a ghost to me is something scarier and maybe, and might oh, even do be, it might even not well, even be in, a conscious in therapy, being. In our documentary, Fair Sense, The Naked Experiments, People, we, we've gone to abandoned prisons and places where there's been um, there's been attacks or sexual things or or and the reason that people we they're naked in these abandoned places in the dark, but it's it's not for voyeurism. It's for the we have all these sensors and all these things, and a couple of times in documentary, two of the people get scratched, and you see them before. There's no scratches on them, and blood starts to flow. From a ghost. Mm -hmm. and I so, didn't know a ghost could actually physically do anything that's, to you. That's just that's the, what we're studying is people are saying you know, they've been groped or they've been touched or they whatever. There's a whole bunch of it. There's a bunch of celebrities that talk about it, like Dan Aykroyd, or, you know, he used to talk about <laughs> Ghostbusters. Yeah. yeah. No, Lucy Liu talks about it. But um, so we're trying to prove we're advancing the science stuff that's never been used for ghost hunting and developing new equipment. To actually, we can actually see the energies, and we're, we're and each each time we do, we 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 advance the technology. So wow. we're this is the beginning of it. This okay. is just the beginning of technology, and we every time we do it, we we advance the technology to we can now see which direction the energy is coming from, where it goes. Wow, yeah, you know, it's never been done before, and this mm. is just this is the infant stages. Of the technology. Can your technology, can you like see a person's chakras and stuff like that or like their aura? That's really in photography. Yeah. I mean, that exists prior to us. And we okay. actually have it in the show. Uh, we, and we watch, we have it in a prison. Chad, the scientist, actually, actually becomes one of the subjects. And 
you know, his, his aura, you see, you can see the aura. It's kind of orangey and reds, you know, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. It's, it's healthy and stuff. And when there's something going on, you can see it turns black. You can see the black, yeah. the black circles and things that happen and how it shifts. And become, when you get scratched, it's black. It turns black mm-hmm. when things happen. And we can watch this in real time. And hopefully, wow. yeah, so it, it's gotten rave reviews and hopefully when we bring it to Seattle, but um, it's also available for uploading online. I don't know all the details yet. It just happened, but um, it's it's extraordinary this journey. It's been okay. Working on this. So, on one hand, it's fascinating, right? Now, on the other hand, I could see how you could regret opening up this Pandora's box of new experiences, especially late at night when you're trying to go to sleep. Now, how do you deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what i can turn it off and okay you know, yeah i i i think i'm more pragmatic and you know it's whatever it's going to be right it, whatever it is i i can't change it i can't create it i can't make it go away it either is or it isn't we're not trying to prove something we're trying to prove if there is something Just, okay here's another one though so <clears throat> a standard technique if you've got evil spirits is to like burn incense or do various rituals. Have you guys done anything, tried done things where like you try to do that and see if that affects the spiritual presence and that you can detect or anything like that? No, because no, because we're this is about touch. That's and all it is. Yeah, this is it's yeah. It, this is a new field. Mm. And it's never been done. We we make we're making history in the ghost world. This is not your standard ghost hunting show. This is not, you know, they they they've said in the past, you know, a, hundred, a thousand ghost shows, no ghosts. Well, we've been to Brushy Mountain State Prison in, in Tennessee. We've been to Turner Joy. We've been to all these places in Washington and Seattle. These places where there's been ghost stories of ghosts hurting or touching or fondling or whatever is going on. And um, and we're, we're sometimes it works. Most of the time it does. And as the equipment gets better and better, we're going to find out more things. So we're not we're not trying to convince anybody. We're just trying to find out is it discover. Real. We just want okay. to know if it's real. If it's not real, it's not real. But yeah. if it is real, let's see if we can find out. And so far, it's extraordinary. What what happens is it's terrifying to me. It's unbelievable. Okay, new question. Um, does it have to be a negative energy, or have you also tried to explore, like maybe going to a church or some sacred place where miracles happen, and try to discover some kind of positive energy type of ghost? You know, that's a hard question to answer because it's not about demons and evilness and all this stuff. This is about whatever this energy is. We're just trying to figure it out. Now, of okay. course, there you know there there are some of the fondlings and stuff and touching is loving it's not it's not mean and scratches we've had that we've had you okay. know bruises and stuff but sometimes it's just caressing okay and you know so you know it's it's i i assume if if, if ghosts are real okay then they have every personality that everybody on the planet's had there's good people and bad people and you know indifferent people and you know with every personality can be can we can imagine it's all of us you know okay what would you be like as a ghost? What would I be like as a ghost? I mean, I, I don't know. And, and I don't know if it's real, but what we're willing to do is let's do the science and see if we can advance the technology. And let's see what we can find out. Because, you know, things are changing fast. You watch Star Wars and Star Trek and all this stuff. And as, you know, as we're looking at quantum physics and, mm-hmm. and new sciences, and we realize even Land of the Lost was talking at the back of the day, dimensions and different dimensions and we're learning more and more of what we don't know we know so we know about <clears throat> fraction of the truth of what's going on in the world right. the planets and all this stuff and we're just breaking into those those door those realms so why wouldn't this be another one of those realms let's let's use science and find out what's going on right yeah um Okay. Well, of course, I mean, if you go and watch on YouTube, if you go to like watch PBS Space Time or something like that, and you watch physicists talk to each other, they all say, nowadays, everything's really weird. (laughs) 
and once you get when you get down into quantum physics and all that stuff, it's like I mean it's like magic stuff again. Nobody understands it, so that opens up all kinds of possibilities. And then um, you you said it might be another dimension. Of course, that's there's a there's a real theory that talks about many worlds that is one explanation for how you know the quantum wave function supposedly collapses into a particle or it just becomes or the, the many worlds one of course is that it never collapses there's just infinite universes and in intimate directions and we just happen to pick one particular slice that we're going to follow and that's our universe at any in at any given moment so yeah i think that's what you're alluding to yeah, what, there. what i know for sure is i know nothing <laughs> Now, I just had an interview. The previous interview I had was that was the person's favorite philosophy, which was the Socratic method, which boiled down to the final essence of it is exactly what you just said. You start from, I know nothing. And I'm willing to observe what I see. But I'm open to learn everything. Right. Or like the Zen thing about first your cup has to be emptied before it can be filled. You know, same I thing. Just, I just, you know, I think if you have preconceived ideas and you want to believe in certain dogmas or whatever and stuff like that, and you follow that, you know, whether even when it when it's telling you it's not real or it's not it's not true, you know, I I, I choose not to do that. I just, you know, I, I I backpacked around the world once. I spent uh I went to third world countries and I spent time in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Oh, cool. You know, and I was I studied religions, and I lived with the Sikhs and the Jains. And oh, the sweet! And uh, you know, moved to Bali and wanted to find out what would be the truth. I mean, I was at the Blue Mosque in Istanbul with the Muslims, and you know, trying to learn and say, what is it? What is your? What is this? You know, is do you really believe in Vishnu? Do you really believe in Ganesh? Do you, it's tell me. I mean, tell me. I want to know what you know. And I was I was looking for my journey. And um, did you so find I, it? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, I'm going to slightly interrupt, but don't lose that thought. Okay, I've also been on a journey since I was 17 years old doing meditation and yoga and everything. And I, I've had been to India once, and I spent the entire time in an ashram. In, in Agua? No, there's. It was. Uh, it was in a small um, village outside of Mumbai called Ganeshpuri Ashram. And um, anyways, as you know, if you've been in India, there's temples and ashrams all over the place. And there's all these stories of all these different saints and stuff like that. It's just everywhere in India. So all I wanted to say was I know what you're talking about. So, But I don't want to interrupt. I want, to, oh, want you to keep going with that. So so you were on a journey. When did you start this spiritual quest? In uh, the late 80s. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, I decided uh, things were things were... I needed to, I needed to, uh, to find some answers for myself. Okay. And uh, and so I went on this amazing journey. And so you probably recognize who this is. Let me see. Wait. Is that Shiva or uh, and who's that? They're playing a flute. Um, that's Krishna. Krishna. I'm sorry. Of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then of course this. My channel is called Pranakasha Productions. Pranakasha Productions became because a long time ago I made this CD. Wait, turn, wait, it glares there. I can't read it. I tilt it. Nice, very nice. And this says Pranakasha, the sounds of Om. And this, there's a tanka of a Buddhist guy meditating. So, I mean, well, I thought I Buddha, have a lot of experience. I, I, thought with this Buddha, I thought Buddhism would be the most closely aligned to what I believed. And, what do you believe? And, but, but it turned out it was I was being pulled by a rickshaw in India, going to one of the seven places where Buddha found enlightenment. Okay. I paid two dollars, and it was twenty miles away. And I, this guy's pulling me and a friend. I did not realize what where we were going and I thought oh my god this was it was just I couldn't believe this was happening and it was so wrong but there was a little museum on a dusty path this was not a big city in the middle of nowhere there was we saw the sign said museum we went in and it was this like 
this, I mean, dust all over the shelves, glass shelves and typewriter. You can see things were typewriter labeling and stuff. And there in the corner, in this little place, it said there was just something, and I'm paraphrasing, I wish I, we had cameras back then and photographed everything, but I didn't. And it just said that every religion says the same. It's the golden rule, do unto others. That's it. And I, you know, I had always believed in that, but I realized that I don't know what the truth is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's out there. The truth is, I don't really care. But all I know is, and the reason I don't care is because I can't alter it. But all I can do is alter my behavior. Okay. And to be as good and as kind as I can. And let that, whatever that ripples into the world of the universe or wherever, that that's my journey is kindness. Wow. Golden rule. And whatever else is not up to me to judge or to create because I have no power over that. And it is the most, for me, it gave me a sense of quiet. And also, you know, every religion, every, every group that starts out always talks about loving and kindness. Wherever it goes mm -hmm. from there becomes whatever it right. becomes, you know. But everyone, as that little typewritten, typewritten page, a little slip of paper said, and it, it just went, boom. I've been, you know, we've been on camel safaris with the Jains in Pakistan. And we've been all of this stuff and learning and really, and not judging, literally, mm -hmm. literally. Because I want observing. To know, observing and really wanting to find out why do you believe? What, what do you, I mean, we're doing, you know, we're, I mean, I'm in the, you know, uh, I'm doing Punjab. I'm doing, I'm in the waters of, you know, of, uh, oh, anyway. we did it all. We lived, we lived the life, went to the ashrams up where the Beatles went up in Hadwa, up in the beginning of the Himalayas. With the so. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Right. So we went up there, do your volunteers mm. work and stuff like that. But, but that wasn't the only religion. That was just one of the religions, you mm. know, and, and that little slip of typewritten paper just kind of. Went up that was it. I mean, we all know it. It's not something we all don't know. You know, I, I, I'm a true believer and we're just being reminded of the truth, not talk. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but that's just me I'm pontificating. And, uh, I, you know, no, that that's... My okay, so the golden rule, of course, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives, right? Right. So it's, 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 it comes out of Christianity. It's one of the best things from Christianity. The other super great thing that Jesus said, of course, is, um, and I always go to this, is um, somebody comes up to him, I think it's a scribe comes up and he says, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, I can tell you. No, the, uh, yeah, and Jesus says, um, I can tell you what it is. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And then he says, and the second greatest commandment is that you love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the scriptures, all the prophets, and everything hang upon these two. And in my opinion, that's it. That's what Christianity is supposed to be, right there. Sure. But is, again, that's one. That's one series of beliefs. Yeah, and when it's you, so close to the look, core. But when you go to the, when you look at the world globally, because you know we live in pockets in our, in our worlds, in the United States or wherever. And when you travel and you live in other people's worlds and their reality, you realize right. it's the same message. Yeah. Just a different, a different form, a different, it's different packaged, flavor. It's just packaged differently. Yeah, and exactly. So, and again, the type, it all boiled down to how they all started, which was loving each other. Exactly. And, 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 and however they became or whatever the dogma happened or the books or whatever, it, it's, to me, it's chatter. What, it's noise. What's important is is the essence of it, and that's that's what I try to live my life. And and that's great. Well, it's obvious. I mean, you exude it. Yeah. Right? Listen, I'm a lucky guy. Yeah. I have a great life. 
I have great friends and we have lots of love and we have tragedies and there's horror and all that stuff in everybody's mm -hmm. life. And it certainly is not, you know, skipped me, but we, right. we muddle through it with mm -hmm. our friends and our love, you know, and. So again, I mean, so you were this guy from Mississippi, right? And I asked you, how did you end up becoming an actor? And you said, oh, tenacity, next subject. Well, there's more to that than that. So what, I mean, obviously you had some goals that you set, right? I just took advantage of every opportunity that came from, from school plays to playing an oak tree, to going to community theater, to, I was selling artwork in Las Vegas after high school. I, when my mother moved us, she was heading the drug abuse program for the state of Nevada. And we moved to Vegas in my senior year of high school. You lived and in Vegas? How many years? How many years? Two years. And then I went to New York. I met Robert Goulet okay. and Carol Lawrence. I was selling artwork at the desert at, at the Frontier Hotel, which is gone. And they asked me to be their driver of a mobile home when I was 17. They were doing a, 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 I Do I Do on the East Coast uh, in their concert tour. And I drove this big Dodge Travco motorhome with Bob Goulet and Carol Lawrence in it. So the thing that comes to mind is to, to do these things. It, it takes a lot of courage, actually. Right? It, you know, it just seemed natural to me. So you were just naturally following who you are. Yeah. And everything worked out. Yeah, I had nothing to lose. Why did you have nothing to lose? Because, you know, my family was, you know, uh, in a different world and my dad was gone and, you know, I, I just had these dreams. I, I, you know, I wanted to be, I just, this just was, I, you know, I don't know what it is. We all, everybody, everybody listening right now has, everyone has a passion, whether you act on it or not is up to you, but every one of us has a passion. Right. And wherever that comes from and wherever that, so you either follow it or you don't, you either beat yourself up and deny it or, you, you know, those great, those, those, the great people that say, you know, if you if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Those are true, you know. What but if somebody says, well, I have all these things I want to do, but I can't because I need to work and make money so that I can survive and my family can survive. Absolutely. So what's your answer and, to that? And that's real because you make choices. So, you know, you have to, everybody's different. So if you choose to have a family, you've, you've, you've taken on responsibilities and the feeding and caring of other people. And that is a passion. Hopefully that is your passion. You've chosen that passion. But what if it's not? Well, if you felt, what if you have this constant feeling that you pretty much sold out, you sacrificed what you wanted to do for just the sake of survival, not maybe your survival or the couple of people around you survival. You just had to say, you know what? I have to survive. I can't do this other thing. That other thing is for people who are rich or people who, you know, are more fortunate than I, but I just have to realize I can never do that because I've just got to survive. What do you say to that? I would say, then go out and volunteer and help some other person achieve their goal. Because in the doing of that, things open up. You see the world differently. Instead of living in your sadness, you're now helping someone else find their joy. And that will change your life and you, and your perception will change and you may find a new path. That's great. So, <clears throat> wow. You're right, Matt, you're right. Listen, we're lucky. We have the resources to make choices. Not everybody does. You know, we're watching the war in Ukraine. We're watching all the stuff that's going on. And, and I'm watching, you know, I do, a, I watch a lot of things on Africa and stuff and how lucky we are that, yeah. that, my, that my goal today is not to find a clean glass of water. Yeah. And that is some people's entire day. And believe me, I don't take that for granted. One ounce do I not take that for granted. How well, you've been to third world countries, you know, like when I went to India, when I got there, I'm like, I might as well be on a different planet. This is so different than the United States, you know? Yeah. And what people told me was when you go to India, um, 
either you love it or you hate it. Like either you've like, I've just landed in paradise and this is the most amazing place, place, or you're like, I just landed in like the ninth plane of hell and I want to get the hell out of here as fast as I can because I can't stand it. So it's, I loved it because I, I picked up immediately on the, the warmth and the welcoming and the re, re, people, would, even when they would just say namaste to me, I was like really into it. And I'm like, wow, you know, like, because namaste, as you know, means I bow to you. So in India, when the people, the parts of India where people say namaste, it's like everyone is worshiping everyone else. They like see God and each other, and it's just assumed that everybody does that. Well, <laughs> that's a whole lot different than in the United States. And I like, I was like, wow, you know. But that's the joy of traveling and cultures and finding different perceptions and different ways that people look at the world. And a lot of it has to do with circumstance. When there's great poverty, you have to find something of value. And that's, that, that's reflected in their caste system, in their religion, in their beliefs. And, you know, you know, because... Well, the thing that... Go ahead. No, please. Go ahead. The thing that got me is I, there were some people there that were considered lower caste who literally all they did all day was sit outside with a sledgehammer and break rocks, big rocks into smaller rocks. And that's all they did, right? It was a woman, a, a very aged woman and her daughter sat there all day breaking rocks. And most people didn't really want to talk to them because they're like untouchables and supposedly destitute. I mean, they were pretty much were, you could see it in their face. And yet they both wore a beautiful sari with all these beautiful colors on it and everything. It was dirty, you know, it wasn't as fancy as other people's ones, but they at least still had a beautiful dress on that I'm like, that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, and that really struck me. I mean, there's a lot of suffering. And, you know, I, 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 I backpacked through, I hitchhiked through Pakistan and India. I slept in my tent in barnyards. I mean, I was not, I was not traveling as a, you know, in hotels and stuff like that. Okay. So I wanted to travel in that way it was uh, my budget at the time. We could do it. I had a budget of $10 a day for travel, food and everything and lodging. And you could get away with that back then in third world countries. Um, and, you know, but I wanted, you know, I wanted to see the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. I went to, uh, I was led into uh, Bangladesh, Burma, uh, is the first, in 20 years, they had not let any outsiders in. And I was one of the first group. And that you're only allowed in for a week. And they followed you and stuff. And I went up to Mandalay and up the Irrawaddy River and stuff. They had a knife fight on a riverboat with some, with some bandits. Um, and went to... Uh, met these uh, monks with saffron robes. They took me to their monastery mm -hmm. where I lectured to the kids and, and traded had all these pins from America, little Statue of Liberty pins and flags and stuff. And it was, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to find something. And I was, you know, went to all the shivas and the, anyway, it just, but it was, it was not about going from, you know, a holiday in to a holiday in, traveling. Right. Yeah, I wanted to live like in the ashrams or, or you know, and I mean, I literally, I remember I, I, some friends were staying in, in, in India at a beautiful palace at the, in Udapur at the, a beautiful uh, lake hotel. And I was in a, a tent in a barnyard with horses all around me in the night. I, I don't, I must have paid 50 cents or something for the right to pitch my tent with, with all the chickens and the, and the horses and things like that. And so the next day I'd take a boat over. And shower in their shower, their luxury shower, and all that stuff, you know. But that was my journey, and uh, so. So, did you now? When was this? Did you feel like a? Is it a like you had to do this? Like you had to find truth, you know? Like otherwise, you know, you just couldn't live with yourself, or was it just sort of a sense of curiosity? No, I, I was. I, I needed to find it. Some things were going on in my life. So it you really not, needed to find it easy and it was my eat, eat pray, love. And, uh, okay. eat, pray, love. I did, I did exactly that. Actually, I went to the exact same places that she Oh, went. cool. Uh, well, she I'm pretty sure she went to Ganesh Bri Ashram. I don't know. Yeah. Did, did you ever go there? I did not, okay. but I got my Kuan Yin and my, and 
you know, in, in my, my garden and stuff. And a friend of mine who would play the Phantom on Broadway, who's one of my, one of my pals, he kept coming here and look around my house goes, too many Buddhas. <laughs> he would start sinking. He said, you know, there's so many like Buddhas and all sorts of things all over the house. But that's right. But it just and, and that's not necessarily what I believe in. You know, I because right. even, even that was disappointing to me at the mm-hmm. end. I saw things that went, oh, it's just another commercial. Yeah. For this. Well, yeah. but 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 it but the point was again typewritten dusty museum that's all i needed it was i didn't need all, it just but but i wouldn't have it would not have resonated had i not experienced right. all these things i was at the point when when the right words came in and they're okay. close for me i went okay done got it well i'm going to go back now to this bible verse i did because the amazing thing is i have gone through a similar journey to you Um, I haven't traveled the world, but I've done tons of yoga and read lots of stuff. And yet now, and I kind of feel like I'm sort of reached a certain level of enlightenment because I've kind of, I've found peace in my heart and I can dial it up with the snap of a finger. It's not, it's not hard for me to go there anymore. It's just always there. I can always go there. That's why I can talk about these things about my dad and stuff that are really upsetting and stuff. And yet, um, it doesn't completely, I don't fall apart talking about it because I just can, right there, there's the peace and the love. Um, So, but surprisingly, I find myself getting drawn back to Christianity, maybe just because I grew up with it. I'm like, you know what? There's a lot of good stuff in Christianity. Like this is a useful religion, actually, if people would actually listen to what Jesus actually said and forget about all the other crap that people are always saying. Like Jesus is one of these enlightened yogi saint people that's like connected to God. And well, I'm like, there gotta, it is right there. In the, yeah, in you've, the got verses. You've got but the, the, the Buddhist and stuff. Consider Jesus one of the incarnates. Right, exactly. One thing, before you go on this tangent, you know, I don't proselytize anything. Mm -hmm. It's not my job. It's not my job to tell anybody what to think or to direction to go in their life. We all find it ourselves, hopefully. And, you know, and I, I, I stay clear for myself of, of anything that has that is kind of loaded right you know and and especially a topic like this um you know this is everybody's personal belief and this is everybody else's journey out there and you know we do learn that, that religion and politics are probably not the most wonderful combination to be talking about uh, except with maybe your best and closest friends you know but and also on this topic all i can say is just love each other and, right. and go, find, go find your joy. And most of the time for me, the joy is giving to others. Yeah. I am dark in a dark place and I feel lonely and not loved. I drag myself out mm-hmm. to go find a way to give love and solitude to somebody else. And so wow. that, that, is, that is the most healing thing you can do. You have a, you have a problem. Help give, somebody. Give what, give what you need. Interesting. Well, that's straight from, again, it's better to give than receive. <laughs> it's from every book from her religion. Right. Yogamesh, 2,000 years before Christianity. Right. The same thing. Right. You know, it's all the books, everyone from, from, from the Torah, from everything. From- right. Well, that's, and that's totally where I'm from, actually. I think it's the reason I'm, I'm I keep going to Christianity right now is because that's sort of, what we sort of in a, in the European world that I live in is sort of considered what people somewhat know, but in reality, well, like, what is familiar is comfort usually. Right. You know, they say you can't go home. You you know yeah you can you go you go back to where you're where you're born. You feel comfortable. You know the rituals. You know the smells. You know the sounds. You know we we go home. We feel we feel at home. You know you. So my suggestion is. 
go where it's uncomfortable. Exactly. Go, go where you have to go, where you have to be on your toes, go where you can learn and not sit back, go where your life depends on communication with others. Well, and that's the thing. I, and it also depends on everybody's personality. Like people would think, well, if you're experiencing love and peace, then why don't you just sit around and experience love and peace all the time? Well, I do. But the thing is, like, at least for me, I'm compelled to want to, when I see, I'll just say it, when I see stuff that's just plain to me, it's just pure bullshit, I am compelled to point it out. And like, I'm to the point where like, I will come up to a pastor, look him straight in the eye, and I'll say, you know what you're saying is complete bullshit, and it has nothing to do with Jesus taught. Because that's where I'm at. That's where I am at. That's the kind of person I am now. Because I have enough um, of my own experience, and I see, you know what? I can see my own experience reflected in the Gospels and the Bible, and I can see that a lot of this Christian religion is way off track, like way off. I would say 95% of it is bullshit. 5% of it is actually valid. And I'm t at the point where I'm willing to just say it straight up like that. Yeah. So. But, but listen, that's <laughs> religious discussions. But you do realize that the Bible was really edited in the fourth century by Pope Gregory. So of it took out the picture. So it's it, it it has no co. You know, it was written a hundred years after this. Jesus was alive. Prophet, this wonderful prophet that was there. You, right. you know, same the same with Muhammad. The same you know with with. Uh, 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 well, the thing is, again, you know, I think what we, what it, well, this... it, 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 an interpretation of these people's lives. It's like it's like you read an autobiography of a person today that was written by somebody that didn't really know. But it's 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 as much as you can find out and understand them by their research. And so, you know, I, I just listen, read what you believe, what you believe. I, there's good in everything. Right. And there's value in everything and all choices we make. You know, when they start to harm people, then you know you're on the wrong path. Well, it's that's what my point is, is that um, there is a lot of harm that's been done in the name of religion. And most of the time, it's because we need more people that are courageous enough to stand up and point out this is just straight up wrong. You know? Well... <laughs> Good for you, and 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 you know, hope you make some change. But you know, I just encourage everybody out there because I don't want to have a religious talk. Okay, <laughs> because this is you know this is private for everyone out there. We all have our journeys. You That's know? true. And I I have no desire to to influence anybody's thoughts. You know, I I, I don't. I I you know I, I just I'm very lucky. You are. Well, you're a very nice, warm, gregarious, beautiful person. Thanks, Matt. So, obviously. Can I ask you one final question? Well, I guess I guess so, yes. Finally, a final question. About but, time. We've been here forever. I know. Like, it, yeah. this, it always happens on my show. We go on and on and on, and it'll go forever unless I actually Thank decide you. to wrap it up. Oh, my gosh, yes. But um, <laughs> so I wonder what your birthday is. What, my birthday? Yeah. August 17th. Okay. So what sign does that make you? Leo. Okay. Yeah. Do you identify with being a Leo? Well, I mean, yeah, there's certain things that certainly, you know, you read, there's, you know, you can see correlation in it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you do definitely have a lot of Leo type of qualities. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, on the well, other hand, is May West, for goodness sake. Right. So. <laughs> I, on the other hand, am an Aries. Okay. So, and I kind of identify with it. That's why I'm like, anyway. That, that was my final question, anyways. So, that was okay. it. That was the big lead up to the final question. Well, that, I. Not really. I mean, that's. As good okay. As then I'll ask you another question. No, I know. Now that's it. Now, well, okay. <laughs> If you don't like that one, <laughs> this is not a religious question. Oh, thank goodness. However. <laughs> can we talk about fun in television? <laughs> my question is, what if you were to describe 
truth or the meaning of life, what it means to be a human being on planet Earth, or not even a human being, what does it mean to be an inhabitant on planet Earth? How could you, what would you say? What's the point? This is a wonderful school. We're all in class. And hopefully we get to graduate at some point, wherever that may be. Right? Oh my God, that sounds so touchy. I want that embroidered or something. <laughs> well, we can make some t-shirts and put exactly. sleeve stacks. I know, I know. <laughs> A wonderful oh. school. Wow. Okay. So now we're wrapping it up. Is there anything? Well, no, thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me on your show. And thank I you. We talked about some great stuff. Now, you know, uh, like these tangents are going like this. Like, oh, okay. Well, that's I hope, me. I, everybody out there, I hope, I hope no offense to anybody out there. And, and uh, Folks, if, if we offended you, you can blame me. You can send all your flame tweets at Matt Weiss, Pranakasha Productions. And, and uh, uh, if I'm in the right mood, I'm going to flame tweet you back, of course, because that's what I am. Well, and Ariel, <laughs> and Puck. If, 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 if we offended the, the mortals, you know, so. Uh, but we, anyway. in the end, we believe in peace and love, <laughs> humanity. We want everyone to be happy and to find their way. Exactly. And also, we need to put some links in the description. So, you have uh -huh. a website, right? You, sure, that's Wesley, how I contacted you. WesleyYear.com or Facebook, WesleyYear, Twitter, WesleyYear, Instagram, WesleyYear. That's oh, the yeah. place. <laughs> and then what's the best way to contact you? I mean, I luckily I did a little digging. Well, I, I, I think I found a, your email through your website, I think, and that's how I I'm got a hold yet, of you. Or just or private message me. To what? Private message me on Facebook or Wesley, your fan page or whatever. Or uh, I think I DM'd you too. But so as you, I mean, some celebrities, I mean, you're a celebrity. Do you consider yourself a celebrity? I consider my I consider myself lucky, you know. I really do. I mean, some guys put up walls that make it really hard to actually contact them. You got to go through their agent, oh, no. and listen, all that crap. But no, but listen, I have my, there's my fan book page and stuff. We uh, Facebook page. We you know we all talk. There's a land of the lost uh, from 1974 to six page on Facebook that you know we are all interactive and we talk and share stories and you know we're we're very involved with with our fans and and uh, right i have made i have some great friends that have that started out as fans and are now great friends of mine that just showed up at your table showed up <laughs> showed up on an elevator so i can point at him when he's walking down down the hall look at me I, I said to kathy okay that's the guy i met in the elevator okay come on let's let's okay so i mean why did you remember what did i do in the elevator that somehow we, made you we, remember me we t I forgot what it was. There was something you were, you were, I forgot what you said or did. And I don't know, but it, but it, but it was, it was nice. And, and, and uh, it was, and, and you said something about why you, why you here or something like that. And, okay. and so then when we we're walking, going to, to set up the next day at our table at Star Trek, I said, that's the guy I met in the elevator. That's Matt. And so that's you remembered just, my name. Huh? How did you remember my name? Probably because you gave me your card. Oh, so you are. So the card that I gave you in the hallway was actually the second one. I think. I think it was the second one. Oh, wow! This is really interesting. I would. I would have never known that. So basically, huh. you're redundant. <laughs> I'll say you're redundant. Oh. Okay. Um. There. That's two cards. Oh, thank you so much, man. Oh, thank oh. you so much. Okay, I appreciate. I appreciate that. <laughs> I've got more. I can send you a whole box if you want. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. Well, you well, never well. know when you're going to get a bird and you need something to lock. Never mind. <laughs> well, there's lots of uses for this. I mean, if you're in a third world country, you could possibly use it as toilet paper. might not be that comfortable, but it'll do the job. Yeah, you had to take it there, didn't you, Matt? You just, you know, this was a classy, <laughs> a classy show right up until that moment. You just went, hmm. Right over the waterfall into the land of the lost. Yeah. Yeah. Run, Holly, run, there's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Oh boy. Oh, run, Holly, run. There's a sleeve stack. There's a dinosaur. There's a Pacodi, but now it's Matt. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, listen, my friend, I'm gonna okay. say Bob. Very good. It's so, it's so happy. Now, do you I, I try to get my all my guests to do the the Spock Live Long and Prosper. Do you do that? Yes. Live long and prosper, my dear Wesley. Uh, it's uh, like a pirate, Wesley. you Does anybody call you Wesley? Uh, uh, arg, Wesley. Yeah, well, arg. That's yeah, pretty well, good. Silver did once, but that was many years ago. Wesley. Arg. <laughs> okay, now we can. We need to respect Spock. Live long and prosper, my friend. I look for you're going to be at Star Trek Las Vegas, right? We're, 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 we're think, we think we are, we got the hotel rooms booked. We, we always kind of wait until the last minute, uh, whether we're going to go or not. I just booked my room and I actually booked a room that's got two queen beds yeah. and I don't even have a roommate yet. So if you're hard up and you need a bed to crash, you can stay in my room unless one of my friends has dibs on it before then. <laughs> <laughs> it'd, be fun, it'd be fun at a new venue this year. Yeah. It'll be cool. Oh, I forgot to say, um. That was actually my first time I was ever in Las Vegas. And honestly, I really wondered whether, actually I drove through it once, but I'd never actually spent some time in Vegas. And I really wondered whether I'd like it or not. I was like, you know, this place is probably so superficial and glitzy, I'm gonna hate it. But I loved it, you know? Yeah. I felt like people were really warm hearted. Everybody wanted to share their story. It was glitzy, yeah, but also everybody was just so friendly and. And get this, okay, we gotta get, we gotta wrap it up. But, but I literally, when I was on this trip, I felt like I was in India. I'm gonna have a little coffee while I sit back for the story, okay? Okay. I felt like I was back in India because I'm on the strip, right? Walking the sidewalk, it's like 110 degrees outside, you know? And people are walking the sidewalk until they get too hot and then they duck into an air conditioned hotel room for a while and then get back on the sidewalk. You know what I'm talking about, right? So, but I noticed there's all these tourists on the sidewalk, but then there's like a, about a foot or two between of the sidewalk, between the sidewalk and the street, where there's all these homeless people hanging out. And like they claim the last two feet of the sidewalk, that's their zone. And I was very much aware of this, that, whoa, this is like India or a third world where you've got like these completely two different worlds right next to each other you know yeah so of course me i sat there i was waiting for a friend of mine to show up in front of a mcdonald's or something and a friend of mine was going to meet me and i'm sitting there there's these homeless guys and i see this one guy just sitting there hanging out he looks kind of indian and i'm like I'm gonna go talk to that guy. So I come up to him, I go, Namaskar Babaji. And at first he looks at me like I'm crazy, but then I keep at it, you know? And then I, he's got this medallion. It turns out he's this guy from Fiji. He starts telling me all this stuff about UFOs and, and all these lizard people and all this mythology. And he is a yogi actually. But yeah. anyways, yeah. And then we, to this day, the guy's my Facebook friend. His name oh, was yeah. John. Super, I, I had to spend it, I talked to him for an hour because I was talking to him for a half hour before my friend arrived. And then I'm like, let's just keep, stay here for a bit. And so then we talked for another half hour. And at the end, I was like, well, I feel like I should give this guy something. I wanted to, I'm like, can I just give you some money or something for your time? You know, like I wanted to give him 10 bucks. And he goes, I don't need your money. Yet. I just wanted to talk. And he walked away. Yes. <laughs> and he had a cell phone and stuff, but he was still living on the street. And so to me, that's like, I mean, that's what India was. All these different people and different uh, lives. And it's somehow living in different worlds. Like we're all in different dimensions, but we're sh sharing the same space. Just like in Vegas, right there, right there. It's just so weird, this imaginary line between that last two feet of the sidewalk and then the rest of the sidewalk where the tourists are. <laughs> it was amazing. 
And I loved it. That's the thing I loved the most about Vegas was that. The dichotomy right there. Well, it certainly is a melting pot. Yeah. You know, that it is. And if you, if you, and bravo for you for taking the time, you know, and I, that my favorite song is what if God is watching us, you know, that person standing on the street corner, you know, we all, you know, you're speaking my language, obviously. So good for you. And, and, and friendships are very strange. Friendships can be made in very unusual places. And that has certainly happened to me many times. Yeah. And it's been one of the greatest joys of my life is finding the unexpected friend. Yeah. It's wonderful. Okay. Anyway. Now, finally, live long and prosper. Peace long and, and prosper. Yes. I love you, man. Like now you're my friend. That's the other yeah. cool thing about these shows is when I'm done with the interview, I feel like I've made a new friend. You know? Absolutely. So. I look. I hope you. I do hope I get to see it at, at, at Vegas this year. I'll for sure come to the table and. We, will, we will, if I'm there. Oh, we'll be I'll see you in Seattle. Yeah, let me know. I'll, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, it'll be on my Facebook. I'll, I'll be posting all the information coming up soon. And then if we do a screening, it may be at a theater for uh, Paris since the Naked Experiment for the the documentary. Where they're they're trying to find the theater right now to, to air it. Oh my God! I have the craziest idea. Um. You gotta end this, but I just played. I I got hired to do a gig at this circus show, basically this circus vaudeville show in Ballard, Seattle, where they're like, my friend called me up and he goes, "Hey, I'm trying to get musicians to play background music for the ticket line. Do you want to do it? It's like you'll get fifty bucks or something, but then you can go to the show for free." I'm like, "Okay, I'll do it because I want to actually have a chance to play my cello in front of people because I play my real instrument is violin. I've been playing violin forever." And cello is somewhat new to me. So I'm like, sure, I'll do it. Can I play my cello? He says, yeah, okay. So I went. And basically, I was like a street musician. I was right there on the sidewalk playing box suites or whatever. I was actually also playing the last movement of my cello concerto that I'm working on for a, a premiere that's happening in June. So I was like, now's my chance to play it in front of people and see if I choke or not. You know, so I did it. It was really fun. Anyways, so if you do this premiere, like, was it going to be in Seattle, did you say? Yeah. Well, I could play cello on the ticket line. What do you think of that? Hey, there you go. That'd be fun. I'm serious. I'd do it. Well, uh, it's yeah. Joe Parrington is the is the promoter for this. So okay. Uh, so how can I hook? I gotta hook him up. You gotta hook me up with him so he knows well, 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 who yeah, Matt Weiss is. Know all the, as I know all the details. Well, I'll 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 let you know. Okay. Cool. And like great. I said, they don't have to pay me. I'll just do it for the hell of it, just for the experience. It's fun. I used to play in the street at Pike Place a lot, long time ago, too. Nice. That's the other reason. Oh, okay, you got to stop me. But that's the other reason why I loved the vendor room. Are you guys out there bored yet? I mean, you're, well, I they mean, probably clicked off by now. Anybody watching? Hello, hello, go, go, go home, go to bed, go to sleep. If you're still watching, we love and respect you. And um, <laughs> we would love you to leave a comment <laughs> and a like, maybe no, subscribe. Don't. <laughs> okay but anyways so oh shoot so i spent almost all my time in that vendor room at at las vegas last year are you matt are you still I love talking? that place are you still talking Is this i'm talking <laughs> yeah yeah i'm talking but I let me just say an hour ago okay but you gotta i gotta tell you why so that vendor room reminded me just of a market it reminded me of when i used to play on the street at pike place Pike Place Market, where there's all these vendors selling vegetables and fruits and jewelry and all this type of stuff. And we're on the sidewalk in front of the very first Starbucks that ever was. We're out there playing classical music on, on the street right in front of it at Pike Place Market, okay? That whole scene, is that vendor room reminded me of the exact same thing. The same energy, you know? Same type of thing. Yeah, that's why I loved it. And I spent so much time in there. I had so much fun talking to all the actors and doing my spiel and passing out my cards and stuff. It was a blast. Nice. So, okay, finally. These, these conventions, you know, it, it's, it really is an old world marketplace. So Yeah. Uh-oh, the dinger went off. I think that means we're dinger, really yes. done. No, my friend Deanne, she, she needs me to talk to her. So Okay, uh, Deanne, I'll, I'll let Wesley go. So finally, with the, for the final last Live Long and Prosper Love and peace. Aren't you going to do it? Well, if Enoch goes on Land of the Lost, Ganactic. Oh, okay. Well, we can do him. And that's what Walter Koenig. Walter Koenig. Okay. So 
But aren't you going to put like it up there? If I remember, it's not start. It's not. It's it's different. I can't, what, what was it? It was. I think it's this. I think it's this one. It's Ganactic. Ganactic. Okay. Ganactic. Ganactic and Prosper. Okay, now yeah. Pranakasha logo is going by. We're fading away. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta 